call this meeting to order at 6.30. Thank you for attending, people. Is there, are there any, the first, first item on the agenda is always public input. Is there anybody here that has any comments from the public that are not on the agenda right now? Okay, seeing none, we move to the student report. Bridget Grew, the incoming president of the Maskers. So congratulations <laughs> for your on that. I'm not going to make you call me Madam President. If you want to, I'm not going to stop you. <laughs> um, so this is our last student report of the year, so thank you for a wonderful year. Um, Mike Tyrell is the only representative graduating, so you can enjoy that or be upset about that either way. Um, so our finals are finishing up tomorrow. They began last Thursday. Um, you have two per day, and they're half days, so it's a good time to study when you get home and then most kids go to work afterwards. So it's a really good schedule and works out nicely for the end of the year. Grades will be closing. Um, pretty much everything had to be submitted by now, and then we'll be getting our report cards probably within the next week and a half or so. Dollars for Scholars was last Tuesday. Um, it's the annual scholarship presentation. It was on the 11th, and in exciting news, there's a scholarship endowment in Mr. Bernard's name now, so that's very exciting. Congratulations nice. there. Um, so good night there. Um, junior students have a busy time right now, which is exciting. They are starting to request college recommendation letters from teachers. Um, they were taking the SATs on June 1st at a few different local high schools, um, and we'll be getting scores back for that in July, as well as any who took any AP exams. Um, we'll be getting those scores in July as well. And then all MCAS testing has finished, and the last one was freshman bio, so we're all done there. We had a very great um, spring sports season. That's some great alliteration right there. Worked on that one before I got here. <laughs> um, and the girls track and field team had an exceptionally impressive year. We had six girls and one boy go to nationals down in North Carolina for track um, and some exceptionally impressive results. Billy Lord set a new school record in the 110 meter hurdles. Abby Martin placed 11th in her division in javelin. Allie Grasso placed fifth in triple jump in her division. And Lindsay McClellan placed 10th um, at nationals overall in the 2,000 meter steeplechase and it was only her second time running the event and if you've ever seen Lindsay run clearly it was not an issue for her at all and the shuttle hurdle team took eighth place overall and the team was comprised of two juniors Ali Grasso and Izzy Perrette um, one sophomore Caitlin Gorghini and one graduating senior Megan Lawler um, for fine arts matters auditions were held for the new jazz band and notorious groups and Maskers announced that we're doing the Music Man in the fall. And then just in other news, Student Council is passing out freeze pops tomorrow as an end of year treat. I'm sure if you guys ask nicely, they'll give them to you as well. <laughs> um, so a good end to the year. I think everyone's excited to be out on Wednesday, but you know, it was a good year overall, very excited. Um, for my work today, I have an essay about the American dream that we wrote in AP English language. Um, it was kind of connected to the Great Gatsby and then you chose a painting and a poem by American authors and painters, and then you compared them to whatever your idea of the American dream is and how you felt they were representative of that. Um, so I included some, like the assignment and then also the rubric on there. So do you have any questions? Cool. Thank you. Questions, comments, anyone? I think it looks good. Yeah. Well, I have two comments and questions. So number one, I want to thank you for helping with Little Mermaid Junior. <laughs> Little School did that last weekend, and I know that a lot of the students, a lot of some of the Maskers students helped the kids, and more importantly, I think some of the parents, because like my wife was running Spotlight and said she had no idea what she was doing, but there was somebody in the booth to help her from the Maskers, so we thank had you so for much. that. They're so awesome. And then on, on the scholarship, is there a certain age you have to be to have a scholarship named after you, or? Well, it's at least 54. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so Mr. thank Chairman, you very much. Do you mind if just a quick Absolutely. comment? I just want to Go publicly ahead. and collectively thank Bridget and the other three, the other four student reps. Michael Michael Tyrell has graduated, as you all know, but uh, he and Bridget and uh, Julia and Lizzie have done a wonderful job um, as student reps. I enjoy my biweekly meetings with them very much to to talk about um, the things that they wish to bring to the attention of, of the committee and the community. As you can tell, I think by their, their uh, presentations at each meeting, they come very well prepared. Um, but we also do have a lot of fun in our meetings, too. It, it, it keeps me very grounded. And it, it keeps me connected to the students, which I appreciate. So thank you. Thank you. 
Any what, questions? I what, what are your what's your summer plans? Um, I'm going to a summer program at Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh. So I leave in ten days, and then I'll be back mid-August. So. Hmm. Can yeah. you start That's looking awesome. at colleges in the summer too? Yeah. <laughs> are you, are you going to look at Carnegie Mellon? It's my top choice yeah. for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. For studying. I think we have a good track. <laughs> Didn't want to assume, but Carnegie yeah, Mellon was, was, a, was a clue for sure. Mm -hmm. Best of luck. Enjoy your summer. Thank you so much. You Thank as well. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. So we'll skip continue business right now since we have a lot of guests here. <clears throat> and we'll start. <clears throat> One thing that we started a year or two ago now is we've Try, we're trying to recognize the teachers that put in so much time that, you know, when they retire. And so um, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Bernard to recognize some of the middle and high school teachers that are leaving us. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Buckley. So I'm, I'm very, uh, I think I have mixed feelings about saying, uh, wishing well in retirement, some of the folks that are here tonight. Um, I've gotten to know them all uh, very well over the years. In fact, for the high school people, I, I, I think without exception, I hired everybody. So it's uh, <laughs> going to be a, 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 nice, uh, a nice evening to, to share some quick thoughts with all of you about um, Mr. Damiano, Mrs. Foreman, Mrs. Passiri, and Mrs. Stadig, who are um, retiring in a couple of days. Uh, Mrs. Foreman staying on a little bit longer to help us <coughs> through the, uh, the fall sports registration season. But um, uh, I'm going to start, I'm going to go alphabetically with Mr. Damiano first, um, who has, Nick, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's been 17 years, right, teaching social studies at the middle school, and, you know, I, I first got to know Nick and his wife, Maria, who was here with him uh, when I was the principal at the high school, and their children came through um, North Reading High School, and, and, and um, just very, very special people, um, wonderful kids, you know, great, great daughters, my gosh, they were, they were so much fun to work with. Um, and Nick, I want to con congratulate you on your retirement and thank you. You've, you've developed a wonderful reputation here in North Reading. I know many students still talk about their experiences with you as their teacher and it's, and it's well earned. Um, the committee does have a gift for you um, and I'll present that to you on their behalf in just a moment. But what we also have done, which has been kind of a longer tradition, is ask retiring teachers to identify a book um, that has special meaning to them and which we then will uh, place in the library of their respective school. And the book that Mr. Damiano chose is Man's Search for Meaning. And when we, one of the questions that we ask on the handout that is provided to them to identify the book that they wish to have placed in the library is, um, why is this book one of your favorites? And what Mr. Damiano wrote is, how does one find meaning when confronted with unconscionable horror? How does one retain dignity in the face of degradation? Victor Frankel gives us insights for living a life of quality. So Nick, this book is going to be turned over to Mrs. Uh, Dr. O'Connell, excuse me, um, and uh, inside you will see that there is a, a little inscription um, that we've created that will dedicate this book in your honor and will be placed in the library for students to, uh, to read when they, when they wish. So congratulations and thank you. And if you'd like to come up, Nick, we have, do you want to put the gift to him? Sure. Absolutely. If you don't mind. Thank you. Okay. So this has become a tradition in the last few years as a, a gift, Nick, um, that the district provides to you. And it's something that we hope um, that you'll hope, we hope you'll display in your home and that when you look at it, will provide you with some special memories of your time in North Reading. You're welcome. And it is, yeah, I don't know if it's, it is engraved with your name too. So it is, it is unique in that respect. So it's, it's special for you. Sure. Thank you for this recognition. It is a bittersweet moment. If I could, I would teach another 10 years, or until they wheel me out, still talking about the Renaissance and the importance of the Enlightenment. It has been an honor and a privilege to teach. I can't think of another profession that has such an impact on children's lives, good or bad. I have always strived that it be positive, supportive, and challenging. There have been many changes in education since I first started out using a stone tablets and hammer and chisel. <laughs> but at its core, education remains essentially the same, to educate the whole child, to weave historical facts into a long, beautiful story of our existence, 
to reinforce the notion that there are no limits to what is possible. To reinforce the notion that there are no limits to what is possible. To recognize and appreciate beauty. To seek out joy. To inspire greatness. I have always been a teacher. I will always be a teacher. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, can I? Yes, of thing? course. Um, I just wanted to say you are probably one of three teachers that could get to my son, and he loves you to this day. So well, thank thank, you. thank Andrew for me. I will. <laughs> I'll add something to that. Uh, nine years ago, I was a long-term sub filling in for about a quarter of the year at North Reading Middle School, and I was the counterpart to Nick. He was teaching history, and I was filling in for Mrs. Jones, who was out for a period. Uh, I'd probably still be lost figuring out what to do if, if he didn't pop across the hall and, and kind of give me intro teaching lessons on the fly, and uh, it turned into my career specifically because of how, how you helped me uh, see just how much fun it could be and what a difference you could make. And, and that's with me, it'll be with me forever. So thank, thank you. you, Nick. Hey. <laughs> They're wishing they could, would be in your class. But. Okay. Thank you very much. Mr. So, Bernard. Yes, so on um, June the 7th, I believe it was, the high school staff hosted a recognition for the, the, the retirees of that school. And I, it was at um, that reception that I presented um, Robin Foreman and Suzanne Passeri and, and Rose Stadig their gifts. Um, so they, I promise they got something of equal value to that Mr. Damiano got, but they already got theirs. But what they did not get was a book. Um, so I'm gonna share some thoughts on, on that in just a moment. But um, as I said a moment ago, I, I, I had the good fortune of, of encountering Robin and Suzanne and uh, Rose um, when I was the high school principal and hired all three of them. And it has been a special, uh, a special relationship that I think I've enjoyed with each of them. Um, Rose and, and Suzanne, as teachers in the special education department, are you know, true advocates for children, um, always worked on, their best on behalf of their best interests, worked very well um, as an administrator. They, you know, Rose, particularly, was kind of one of my go-to people, and I know that that has followed true for for Mr. LaPrat as the high school principal now, but um, both very, very dedicated to the, to the important work um, that they do as teachers in the special education department, and I want to thank them. Um, Robin, um, you know, <laughs> Robin was, you know, again, as a high school principal, you know, the athletics is a big part of the, of the work of the high school principal, and uh, it was very, very reassuring for me to have Robin uh, in the office of the athletic department, making sure that students were First and foremost, that they had their physicals in order. That was always the most important thing before they could get out on the field. But um, I got to know Robin and, and, and first knew her husband, Eric, who's with her tonight and retired last year um, as a music teacher here at the high school. But um, Robin, you know, has, it was a very, is a very special person and did some very, very difficult work under some tough conditions. I mean, when kids were down there, wanting to get out and practice with their teams, and, and they didn't have their paperwork in order. Robin was truly like another mother to them, and would just work them through it, calm them down, we'll fix this and get it going. And it was um, special work, too, that you do, Robin, so thank you. And for um, the book dedications, um, Mrs. Passeri uh, chose um, Tender is the Night, and in answering her question about um, why this book was one of her favorites, she wrote that I enjoyed reading The Great Gatsby, which is read in American literature classes, and thought that Tender is the Night would be a special read as well. So Suzanne, as, as a former English teacher, uh, I appreciate very much the Fitzgerald uh, dedication. And like, um, like Nick's book and, and, and Rose's book, this will be dedicated to your work in the high school. And I'll turn this over to Mr. LaPrette for placement in the high school library, so thank you. And No Joke is probably my favorite book. Again, a former English teacher, Robin. You can't go wrong with, to, uh, excuse me, Rose. Uh, you can't go wrong with To Kill a Mockingbird. Um, and, and in answering the question of why this was Rose's favorite book, she wrote, reading this book again and again, I never tire of it. It is as relevant now as it was when it was written. Discussing, with, discussing it with my students always brought, brought about rich discussions about courage, empathy, and racial injustice. So we will proudly display this in the library for students. And thank you, Rose. And I want to thank all three of you for 
fine, fine service over the years. And wish you well in retirement. Thank you. Want to do a picture? So if you folks don't mind a photo. Kai. You want to do that? Everyone coming up? Yeah. yeah sure. Is that okay? Everyone, yeah. Okay, and <clears throat> so continuing on with the recognitions tonight at the end of the year, we have a certif uh, certificates of appreciation for a couple of people here tonight. Uh, Representative Brad Jones, as well as, as his son Nick. I know John wants to speak a little bit about it, but the one thing I will just say first and foremost to Mr. Jones, or to Representative Jones, is I think that <clears throat> there's a lot of anger and frustration in government these days, but I think it's great that at the local level, you know, in North Reading, we're very fortunate to have, you know, a representative like you who is looking out for the, for the school, for the town, it's like sometimes things don't get done, but when you have good local representation, it is very important. And so I think you know you've you've made a, a priority to help the community around here, North Reading, and the other towns around here. And so we really appreciate having that relationship with you. So thank you very much. Okay, Mr. Bernard. Oh, I think that that's an excellent introduction, <laughs> and I could not um, could not echo more more strenuously how wonderfully supportive Representative Jones is um, to the community and to the school department. I mean, to, to know that I have your cell phone number is very reassuring, and I've and I've used it. <laughs> you know, and it, it, you you have done a lot on behalf of the students of the district, Brad. And I, I think this is just a very small token of a public um, display of our appreciation to you for that. I do want to just call out um, the fact that um, just coming up on about two years ago. We first had a, we had our initial conversation about how might um, we be able to acquire some um, some funds from the state to support a couple of initiatives that were pretty pretty important to the school district. One being school safety and security, and the other being advancing our our one to one uh, technology model for students. And um, the short story is, as he often does, he came through for us and, and advocated pretty strongly and acquired two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in the fiscal year 2019 budget, $175,000 to be spent on school safety and security upgrades, and um, $75,000 to advance the one-to-one the -one digital learning model, which in my, in my coming up on five years as the superintendent is probably one of the more significant educational initi initiatives we've, we've undertaken. So your support of that has been, has been significant, and I want to thank you for that. And that, next to him, probably uh, probably going to be running for his own election soon, I don't know, this is his son Nicholas, who I asked Nicholas to join his dad here tonight because um, back a couple of months or so ago, Brad reached out to me and said that his son had, had asked him, and I, don't know, I certainly don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think the essence of the story was that he had asked his father or told his father that there are no POW MIA flags at the middle high school. And so um, he urged his dad to acquire two of those flags, and they brought them in just, uh, just before Memorial Day. And they were here, the two of them, putting the poles together and, and um, raising those two flags proudly, one on display in the middle school in the, uh, in the foyer and the other one in the, um, in the Performing Arts Center. And so I want to thank you both, Nicholas, for planting the seed with your father and, and, and for Brad for, for carrying through and, and having those flags uh, displayed proudly at our school. So we have, um, the committee has, I think, a certificate for each of you. Again, it's, it's more of a gesture, but we wanted to publicly acknowledge and thank you for, for, those, two, um, for those two efforts. So thank you, gentlemen. <coughs> Maybe a photo. You want that photo? 
Jeez, you guys dressed for yeah, pictures tonight. <laughs> no. <laughs> Gil, do you mind? Okay. Everybody? Yep. <laughs> And we know he stays in touch with the town <coughs> quite frequently. Yeah, about a half an hour. Yeah, I know. <laughs> oh, he's watching now. Yeah, he is. Maria, nice oh, to see you. Same Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you very much. I look forward to getting together and talking about what our next endeavor will be. Okay. We look forward to it. Yes. <laughs> okay. We should probably go back now to the continued business, or do you want to finish on the presentation? We, do, we can do presentations first. Yeah, we can do presentations. We're switching order. We're going to go the high school first. Mr. LaPratt. Okay. I'm going to go up to that. <coughs> okay. Oh, excuse me. Sneaking by you. Oh, go ahead. Hey. So it's a pleasure to uh, provide our year-end update of the high school's school improvement plan. Our uh, members, a great group of uh, teachers and student representatives, uh, parent representatives. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a wonderful year working with this group. As in the past, we'll uh, focus on a couple of highlights from this school year, look at some upcoming um, points of interest that we're anticipating for the 1920 school year, and then kind of uh, finish off with uh, an assessment of the goals that we have in place. So some highlights from 2018-19, uh, very happy to have our one-to-one -one initiative begin at the high school. Uh, and again, thanks to our Representative Jones for his work there. Um, so we all, all grade nine students have Chromebooks. In fact, we collected uh, those Chromebooks uh, today, many of them. Uh, a, a good number, so that's good that they're staying on top of it and, and being responsible with it. Um, a lot of professional development work around the uh, topics of universal design for learning and personalized learning um, with uh, some teacher-led initiatives and some district-led initiatives on both sides of this. Uh, and so it's nice to have the teacher buy-in directly and it's, it's uh, these are two uh, very important areas uh, that the district is looking to uh, incorporate <coughs> into uh, larger goals. Um, some great enrichment opportunities this year with Ed Garrity, who speaks to the freshman class. Uh, Travis Roy, uh, you may recall that he was on campus in December, and uh, Mark Merrow uh, spoke to the uh, upperclassmen in February. And uh, we also had a special um, kind of uh, student uh, safety wellness uh, opportunity with the Clay Soper uh, story, if they had known, and um, Mr. Bernard was essential in, in getting that, um, uh, the CIT, uh, getting that um, program for us. The freshman advisory program continues uh, with SLAM, SLAM mentors. Uh, they just had the next round of SLAM mentors just had their training a couple of weeks ago. Um, we've found a lot of success promoting student wellness, stress reduction, uh, things like that. We had a, a batch of wellness workshops from our school psychologists and our counseling staff this year. Uh, so that's worked well, focusing mainly on the junior class. And we'll look to expand that in uh, the 1920 school year. We had a great uh, international travel opportunity for students. We had 42 students travel uh, to Eastern Europe, uh, landing in Germany, uh, going to uh, Hungary, through Slovenia, down to Croatia, and back to Germany, heading home. Uh, a fantastic trip. Other highlights from 18 and 19, the uh, curriculum uh, work continues in science and in social studies, as certainly as the social studies department uh, looks at uh, the changes that the state is um, recommending with respect to that curriculum. 
As uh, Bridget mentioned already, and I don't know if she got that, that <coughs> other fact in there, another spring track state championship for the girls track team, and that is the fourth straight. Two straight in uh, Division Four, and then back to back in Division Three, and a lot of those athletes coming good, back huh? again. So it's a, it's quite a run. Um, wouldn't wouldn't ask, so to speak. <laughs> um, our advanced placement uh, program remains strong. We have uh, again over 13 percent. I'll call it kind of scheduled seats in an advanced placement class, um, and that's a number that has stayed very uh, consistent over the years, so that's nice to see. Um, and again, our student council, which is, which is unbelievably active, recognized as a National Gold Council of Excellence for the third straight year. Very proud of that group. Um, a couple of other highlights from 1819, the seal of bioliteracy for the first year, uh, recognizing um, seven graduates and six other students receiving local recognition, I will say, there was a, um, a local poll that went around some North Shore uh, principals that I participated in kind of assessing who's where with the uh, seal of biliteracy. And I will say we were uh, very much in the leading group of, of, of districts uh, ahead of the curve on this. So that's very um, nice. A lot of hard work from uh, community members, parents, Ms. St. Arnaud, Dr. Daly, um, getting this seal of biliteracy in a, in a place where we're recognizing students in uh, at least two languages, proficiency in at least two languages, um, and that uh, having that designation on their diploma. We welcomed uh, Mr. Owens to the art, uh, performing arts department. He's been a fantastic addition, and um, we'll get a little bit more to that in a minute, but we uh, had, uh, again, with our very talented uh, Theater group, maskers uh, with uh, two shows, Shrek and The Lion, the Witch in the Wardrobe, both getting recognition. Shrek was nominated for the uh, Best Properties category within a performance um, by the uh, MET, the Mass Ed Theater Guild. So Best Properties is essentially set design, what the set looks like, and how that transforms throughout the, throughout the show. Um, and The Lion, the Witch in the Wardrobe was a semifinalist in the Drama Fest competitions. And then on to Notorious, our musical, uh, our musical club and also the choir uh, got some nice awards in the uh, Six Flags New England competition. So not only did they win the mixed choir, so that was the, the a cappella group, Notorious, with the student choir group, but also they won the best overall um, performance uh, at that competition. And then Varsity Vocals, another, another uh, real feather in the notorious cap, uh, second place in the Northeast semifinal. Now, looking ahead to 1920, well, let me just stop. Any questions about all of those highlights? I know there's a lot there. But uh, the high school's a busy place, as we know. Um, yes, sir. Well, I'll just make a comment. I think Mr. Owens, I think he was highlighted in the transcript this week. and. Ironically, I've had after the drama this uh, uh, last weekend of the little school, I had a couple of parents mention about how how impactful Mr. Owens had been on some of their students this year, and specifically called him out about how you know how how important he's been in w with their kids. And so I just thought it was it was nice that parents came up to me and said, "I just want you to know how important you know he's been in my kids my students' life." So I thought it was That's nice crazy. to point out. Thank yeah, you. thank you. Yeah, I, I'm sure you'll hear similar sentiments <coughs> when Miss uh, Miss O'Connell comes up. But um, yeah, I think uh, the, the, his style is one that's very accommodating for the students. Um, and I think the buy-in from the student side is, is very evident early on. Um, and it's certainly from my observation. So now looking ahead to 1920, we're gonna be expanding the one-to-one uh, -one model so we at least covered in grades nine and 10. We're looking to add to our digital learning and entrepreneurship department to bring in um, another, uh, another uh, teacher in that department to broaden, again, course offerings, look to provide uh, instructional support for teachers as well as we have more devices accessible to more students in more classes. Um, I will say that uh, new hires already for the 1920 school year 
uh, in the special ed department. We know we've had a number of uh, special ed teachers just recognized in their retirement. Uh, dual certified teachers, um, one in special ed and um, biology, one in special ed and English, already on board for next year. So these, uh, these are very significant hires that um, I think really uh, support not only our standard uh, students in, in uh, academic uh, settings, but also for students that have specific needs uh, to have a dual certified person. Um, so two already uh, joining our faculty. We have two uh, new courses, the uh, Modern World Literature. You might recall that we, we uh, approved that uh, very kindly um, earlier this year for upcoming, uh, for a senior class. Um, the uh, Common App Boot Camp in its fifth year, hard to believe. Um, our bridge program continues. That's in its fourth year. Uh, we just had a, uh, uh, a meeting with the uh, kind of our bridge um, advisor with the larger, the Bright model, uh, which oversees or supports or, or uh, provides uh, uh, planning uh, for uh, a number of uh, districts uh, in Massachusetts. Uh, and we go through an annual assessment of, um, against a rubric. Uh, so we had, we had some nice growth in that department. Uh, we brought on some, some uh, faculty that have really supported that department and the bridge program. Um, is, is, I think, as strong as it's been. Uh, we have, again, student, uh, continued student interest in the uh, internship program, a number of students signing up uh, for the 1920 school year. So it's nice to see that growing. Now, uh, any questions? Kind of looking ahead. Move on to uh, the goals for the 1920 school year. Um, continue to advocate for staffing to maintain or improve student-teacher ratios that allow for a high level of personalization and instruction. Um, and again, that, that I think, you know, uh, it's been mentioned before, but kind of connection with the, with the student and making the student engaged and feel connected to the curriculum, whatever, whatever the topic as the key, but, uh, you know, there's kind of a, a renewed attention to this idea of personalization. So uh, that kind of goes back to some of that teacher training that we've talked about this year already and uh, supporting you know, uh, uh, more professional development in that area. But again, it's reflected in the first goal. Enhancing the program for students in, in curriculum instruction and assessment with a particular emphasis on providing students with the skills they need. Goal three, making sure that what we're doing uh, is in line with the um, Continuous improvement for uh, the district goals, NRPS 2021, and the New England Association of Schools and Colleges as well. Naturally, we look to, again, round out the program that we offer the school with uh, extracurricular activities, uh, whether they be clubs or activities or sports, um, or again, the maskers and the arts and things like that. Uh, naturally, the school, uh, School Council is very attentive to those type of topics. Um, again, looking at expanding the use of technology, that kind of ties back to our one-to-one uh, -one, uh, initiative that we're expanding. Goal six, again, references the uh, New England Association of Schools and Colleges. I did submit the five-year progress report. Um, that was submitted on the 28th of February. So we'll get a re getting a response from them in the early fall, I imagine, around that report. Um, so we are keeping updated with respect to whatever recommendations that they have uh, asked us to respond to. Uh, last couple of uh, items here for us. Naturally keeping a uh, positive and uh, working relationship with the middle school, uh, both the administration and the faculty, so that there's equity um, and accessibility as we share the building. And goal eight, uh, making sure that we're, again, that our curriculum is in line with the uh, mass curriculum frameworks. Again, attention to changes that have happened over the years in English and math, new changes uh, recently in science, and then anticipated changes and aligning to those changes in the social studies department. Um, and that's been a nice opportunity for, for both the middle school and the high school to work collaboratively as we look at uh, how a change is going to 
matriculate, matriculate through um, as the students do uh, with respect to the social studies curriculum. And goal nine, continue to utilize the educator evaluation model um, when performing uh, teacher evaluation. Again, with the sole purpose of enhancing teaching and learning. Yes, sir. Chris, can you grab a, grab a mic? Too? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Chris, yeah. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Mike. Um, for goal seven, yeah, uh, sure. what would you say are the, the, where are the sticky spots in, in sharing the space? Where, you know, where are the hurdles that you guys have to overcome regularly or that pop up? Well, I think, I think it's about communication <laughs> and just making sure that, um, you know, while we might think something's, you know, uh, I think I booked this space or I think I booked that space, that there's, that there's you know, at times there are uh, little hiccups that happen along the way around communication. But I think the, you know, the level of collegiality and respect and understanding really overrides uh, any kind of um, problem that might arise, I know the first thing that typically happens is, okay, you know, nobody really loses their cool, but what, what can we do? What's the situation? When do you need it? How long do you need it? What can we do? Can we move over here and you can move over there? And um, I would say the other, the other sticky spot is scheduling classes uh, in exclusive areas where we know we need to share daily. Um, and we've talked, uh, you know, a lot about, um, say, the video production <coughs> area. Works best for middle school, either um, somewhere with somewhere in the middle of the day. So I'll I'll schedule that in the morning or in the afternoon. Uh, and those type of you know more kind of stationary things are, are a little easier once we get them uh, scheduled in. But sometimes the uh, the day to day things can get you know require require extra extra but emails and phone calls. And the flexibility yeah. of you know kind of a space like this and saying okay well you know how much how, how how many seats do you need can we move this group here can we move that group there the library in that library classroom sometimes a group will take this but they're small enough they can go there and so there's a uh, you know we we get creative yeah. we get creative gotcha now it's uh, it's impressive you can see just the the way that um, flexibility kind of rules the day and, and a good working relationship can fix that. Uh, if I had had a share of bedroom with my brother growing up, <laughs> I don't think either of us would have made it. So good okay. for you guys. <laughs> Thank you. It's a good analogy. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> as, as the parent. <laughs> Rich, you have questions or, or no? I, 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 I have a couple questions. So I am not a big person on testing, so I'm not, I don't want to go to testing, but I will say all three elementary schools and the middle school also all focused on the MCAS scores and improving them, specifically looking at people that were not, or students that were not, you know, meeting the goals. And I just noticed in, in this improvement plan that there, that wasn't mentioned there. And I'm just curious if it was intentional or, or are there specific goals on improving for the MCAS scores or, or not? So, uh, yeah, excellent yeah. question. I will say with respect to, um, let's say by, uh, by discipline. The English, our English scores are very high um, and they've always been very high. We're kind of 98.5%, you know, uh, either, we haven't, had a, we haven't had a failure in English in a couple of years. Um, we might have three or four kids on uh, an EPP, you know, scoring in the needs improvement mm -hmm. category. Um, so, you know, I, I think, that, 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 that doesn't come up because I, it's, it's always a, it's a strength. Um, and you know, if, it's, if there were a problem, I think, I'd, we, I think we'd be paying more attention to it. I think our math and um, our science numbers, our science numbers have dipped down a little bit, but there are, there, you know, I, I would say with respect to the model that we're using as far as inclusion and things like that, um, we're, we're never really in, a, in a, what I think is in an area where um, we can't find st certain strategies to improve uh, science scores. 
if we have a, a student that doesn't meet at least a minimum passing score, they'll meet it on the next, the next testing cycle. Um, the, the, the report card that, that uh, is on the web, mm -hmm. um, you know, and that uh, is our accountability report card. Um, you know, I, I think that um, the way that that is designed <laughs> is kind of funny math to me a little bit anyway. Um, and we know that um, students that score in the lowest 25% get kind of double counted. Um, so we can, you know, I, I can certainly take your feedback and say, yeah. hey, let's, let's, let's look more at this. And, but the school council, you know, as we go through this information, and they have, they have all the numbers. I mean, we, we count mm. um, I think the idea is as we look to raise the whole program, these other, these other <coughs> scores, test scores, will come up. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the philosophy. And, and, and again, I mean, I, I, I'm not a teacher, I'm not an educator, and I don't, I don't try to be, but it's just interesting because all, all the other improvement plans focus a little bit on some of the numbers there, and, you know, and, and also with AP scores, like we, we called out the fact that, as Mr. Bernard's mentioned many times at the meetings, how many students are challenging themselves with AP courses. Sure. But again, there have been, you know, a couple of specific areas. I think chemistry was one that stood out, I remember, where like, we haven't always done particularly well in some of them. And so, again, I just, I just want to make sure that when we're, you know, we're looking at the school improvement plans that we're, again, while I don't think testing is the be all and end all, I do think it's something that it was just, it was noticeable to me that comparing the improvement plans that there was no focus at all or no mention at all of, of the numbers about how we're doing and, you know, any sort of goals to try to, you know, make improvements in certain areas if we see that in, you know, a particular area, a science class or, or a science course or a math course that we're, you know, we haven't made improvements from year over year. So it's just, just yeah, a I, note. I would, so. say, I would say those, that, that yeah. type of focus is, is in there. It's yeah. just not specifically okay. identified. Are there questions, comments from the committee? Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Dr. O'Connell. Hello, everyone. Before I start, I just wanted to say thank you. I feel very supported in the community. This is my eighth year. It's gone by so fast, but my eighth year as the middle school principal and reflecting back on preparing for tonight, I feel very grateful to work in this district. I also live in the district, and I just think it's um, comforting to know that the community values the schools and that we have the support of the community, so thank you. My plan We'll begin, as AJ's did, with the highlights from this year, and I apologize for the display, but our highlights are meeting our teaching and learning academic achievement goals from the 2017-18 school improvement plan. Those goals were to increase the student growth percentile in each of the tested subjects, ELA, math, and, well, science doesn't have a growth percentile, but in ELA and math, the goals from the previous year were to increase the student growth percentiles in two of the three grades, and we successfully did that in both ELA and math, so I'm very pleased with that. The goal for science, because science is only tested, it's tested in fifth grade and then eighth grade and then in high school, so they do not do a student growth, they don't do the student growth percentile. So what we just looked at increasing the percentages of students that are in the advanced category and the proficient category and decreasing the percentage of students in the needs improvement and warning categories, and we successfully did that as well. I'm looking forward to the results. I don't want to jinx myself, but I'm looking forward to the 2019 science results because we've worked very hard to implement the new science standards over the course of the last three years, and this is the first year of the new test where the new standards are being assessed, and so I'm really hopeful that the results will show an, a further increase in the area of science. It's something that we've really been focusing on. Additionally, we've been very successful in implementing a multi-tiered system of support, and what that is is a fancy, uh, a fancy term for intervention blocks. So once a week, we flexibly group students by areas of need academically, and um, we focus in the areas of math and reading, so we take our we tier the kids, so the students who need the most need in those areas go to our math teachers or our special, ed special education teachers who focus on those areas of math and reading. 
We also offer support in executive functioning. And if you know an adolescent or have an adolescent or were an adolescent, <laughs> um, executive functioning is organization and kind of getting everything organized in your head and on paper for academic and I would say life success. So we offer executive functioning interventions run by our school psychologists. So we do that each week. Students who do not require those academic interventions are given, are provided with enrichment uh, lessons and enrichment opportunities in the areas of science and social studies. So oftentimes teachers feel that they have these really great uh, projects or really great lessons, but they can't use them anymore because they don't align you know, exactly to the standards. So this gives them an opportunity to do something a little bit outside of their normal um, curriculum still aligned with you know still aligned with the standards but it gives them an opportunity to teach an enrichment block so that's been very successful at the middle school additionally I'm very proud of our uh, efforts to improve the social emotional well-being of our students and the behavioral component of their of their growth through middle school so we've been implementing another um, you know educational jargon term positive behavior and intervention support framework. And what that means is we emphasize the positives and we tell the students what we want them to do. Instead of telling them you can't do that, you can't do that, you can't do that, we tell them what we want them to do. We reward them verbally and with green tickets that they can then have an opportunity to win a individual prize or a grade level prize, an extra few minutes at lunchtime or a uh, homework free weekend, which again, if you know an adolescent, is real money to have a homework free weekend. So we've been um, really monitoring our behavioral and emotional, um, I would say data, mostly behavioral, like if, if students are referred to the office for discipline, we've been really taking a close look at those numbers and what, how we are intervening with students to try to reduce the number of students referred to the office because anytime they're referred to the office, as you know, they're missing instruction time. So we want them in the classroom as much as possible. Other highlights outside of the classroom include our Adams Family musical, which was in the very first week in February. It was outstanding. It was a team effort led by Carla Lister, our amazing performing arts coordinator. And I think what makes me most proud when I think about the Adams Family, but also many of the musicals that Carla has led is how inclusive it is of all of our students. If you want to be a part of the middle school musical, you can be a part of the middle school musical. And there were, I would say, 75, 80 kids par participated in some capacity in the musical, and it was amazing. Speaking of Carla, we also had our winter and spring concerts. So Carla does the chorus, as you know. And Mr. Owens, mentioned earlier, has done an exceptional job in his rookie year as the middle school and high school band director. When a teacher is new to the district, they are observed by their evaluator five times. One of them is announced, four are unannounced. So I was in Mr. Owen's class more than five times. And each time that I went in and observed him, the students were engaged, they were excited, they were playing great music. Especially when I went into the high school, the music <laughs> sounded a little bit better than it did with the sixth graders. But more importantly, kids really were excited to be in the band room, and he has had a great year. We also had our Project 351 candidate. They, they, she actually came and presented, Talene Toby came and presented to you back in March when we had our school committee presentation. We had our Ma March Madness Tournament, which is a extracurricular activity for students to play basketball, student teams, and then they play a faculty team. The game is actually tomorrow at 1.30, so every year I play, and my goal is to score at least one point, which I've done successfully, and, and not trample any children. But little seventh and eighth grade uh, kids, boy, can they run fast when it's full court. I'd wish we played half court, but. <laughs> Wait, which, which is the priority, scoring or trampling, not trampling? <laughs> <laughs> scoring, I'm a competitive, <laughs> competitive person. Um, our Geography B winner this year, Christian DaCosta, for the first time, we think, in middle school, North Reading Middle School history, he pl placed the highest, fourth in the state, which is pretty incredible. Oh. Christian is an eighth grader going on to the high school, so we'll need to be keep tabs on him. He's, he's a talented young man. We also had our History B. Our Science Olympiad team placed 11th out of 30 teams. They actually also came to the march. 
school committee presentation right before their uh, competition, and they did very well, very pleased with their performance. Uh, 180, I believe, students just came back on Friday afternoon, Friday early evening from their Washington, D.C. trip led by Mr. Maloney, our assistant principal. It was an incredibly successful trip, lots of uh, great first-time experiences for our students. It's, it is such a consuming trip to put together. Mr. Lopret spoke about the Europe trip. I can't imagine taking children to Europe, but taking up 100 and almost 90 students uh, to the capital is a huge undertaking and again very successful great experience for the kids uh, tomorrow we have our legacy day for our eighth graders which is their moving on assembly it's a really nice opportunity to um, acknowledge each of their achievements for finishing middle school and moving on to high school wherever they go and we we also have a field day and then it got cut off a little bit, but I, as AJ mentioned, am so grateful to have the one-to-one -one initiative at the middle school. This year we had seventh and eighth graders each having their own Chromebooks, obviously owned by the district, but their own Chromebooks to take home and bring back and use throughout their day at the middle school. And just having them on their person rather than on a cart is so valuable, especially valuable for the non-core academic teachers. So people like Carla, Carla Lister or Ben Owens or you know any Jesse O'Brien, any of our um, non-core academic teachers. When the when the students come with their Chromebooks, it's so much easier to use the technology and implement the technology. So we're really grateful again to the town and the school committee for allowing the Chromebook initiative to occur. As far as our goals go, the, my school council helped me create these goals. We break our, our goals down under the headings of NRPS 2021, so teaching and learning. We have, I believe, four goals. The first one is to improve the, increase the student growth percentile in English language arts based on the MCAS data from the spring. So when we get the data probably in August, we'll take a look at that, set our benchmark goals, and we want to improve the student growth percentile for all three grades in, the, in you know, 2020. As I said previously, in the previous school improvement plan, 17-18, we had said we were going to improve in two of the three grades, and we did successfully do that for a couple of years, so I think it's obviously important to move beyond that, so we said in all three grades we would improve the student growth percentile. Again, I mentioned earlier there is no student growth percentile in science, but we want to improve the scores in the aggregate based on the current performance from this past spring. Math is the same, improve the student growth percentile for all three grades. And then goal number four, you may think, why is that related to teaching and learning? But it very much is to me, and those of you who know me, I think know that it, that it is really important to me, that climate and culture, climate and culture levels do have an impact on achievement, on academic achievement. There's lots of research that supports that. So if students feel good about coming to school, they feel safe at their school, they feel supported by their peers and their teachers, research will show that they perform at higher academic levels. The same goes for the adults. If the adults feel good about coming to school, they feel supported by their adult peers and by their administration, their efficacy and their ability to teach is, is, has been proven to be at a higher level when they, when they feel uh, valued. So we're constantly working on improving the climate and culture for the students and for the adults and for the student adult community together. That has been a goal for the last few years. We do measure it every year. Uh, we have students take a climate survey and staff take a climate survey and then the school council analyzes those results and decides on some action steps to improve both of those levels. Technology and integration, again, following NRPS 2021 headings. Again, I, I've mentioned before in the highlights, we will continue to work with Dr. Downs to implement the Chromebook program in grades seven and eight. It would be wonderful if someday it could move into sixth grade, but we'll, we'll be very happy with our seventh and eighth for a while. Um, I do think it's very important, I think I mentioned this last year, that we continue with the teacher professional development regarding how to use the Chromebooks because you, you can give anybody technology and they could just use it as a word processor. If you teach them and show them the innovative ways to implement technology into their teaching and their instruction, it's much more impactful. So we're working with 
the end downs to make sure that we don't just give the devices to the kids, but we train the teachers on how they can best use them. I'm also working closely with the Assistant Superintendent, Dr. Daly, to create a data management tool through Google Data Studio that allows us to do a better job of not really analyzing the data, but getting the data in one place so that we can analyze it. We're still using multiple databases, and you, you know, we need to go to multiple places in order to see different data points on students, and we're looking for a tool that we can create internally to allow us to go kind of one-stop shopping to see all the data points that are important for each student. So we're working on that um, with Dr. Daly. And then the last area, student support services. Again, I, I've touched on some of this, but we will continue our multi-tiered system of support. We think that that's really important to once a week make sure we're stopping and making sure that we're providing interventions as needed. Goal number two is perhaps my most, to me, my most exciting um, announcement. To, and again, thank you for supporting our, our, our vision to have the middle school all be on the same schedule. It was uh, roughly a year ago when I had put this as something that we wanted to be able to do for this 2019-2020 school year. And I got your, your blessing to pursue a schedule. And then we were able to work with Michael Conley and the superintendent to, to have the budget allow for an additional um, class in sixth grade, a computer science and a foreign language class that I, I believe the school committee is well aware of. And that's going to allow us to have the middle school all operate on the same daily schedule. Prior to that, each grade had its own unique <coughs> schedule. So it literally was trying to manage a three ring circus because everybody was kind of moving and changing classes at different times. So we're very grateful for that and very excited to be able to implement that in September. And then the final goal is always on my mind. I've spent a lot of time already this spring preparing for the incoming sixth graders and making sure that our in-district programming, our special education program, programming, but also our basic you know, instruction meets the needs of all of our students. One thing that we're going to try to pilot in September is having a lead teacher, a lead special education teacher create I don't want to say it's a bridge program like the high school, but a social emotional um, program perhaps is a strong word, but we're going to have a social emotional lead teacher, a special ed teacher, as someone who can take a caseload of students on who are really needing intense support in the area of social emotional well-being, which again, if you know me, is an area that I, I think is super important and, and needs to be addressed, and if we can have someone in-house who's trained and able to provide those interventions along with our school psychologists, I think we'll be better able to keep our students healthy and emotionally, uh, emotionally healthy. So those are the goals for the year. Is there a question? Chris? Uh, yeah. Um, I just when you first brought up the multi-tiered system, I was curious. What, I, I have a, a good sense of what it looks like, but, but in the in the day-to-day, week-to-week life, uh, a, a kid who needs enrichment or, or could use enrichment or needs support, are they in the same program for the year? Is it changing? That's throughout? a great question. We change it every nine or 10 weeks. So initially in September, we look at the MCAS data and we use iReady. I think everyone's familiar with iReady as a diagnostic tool for reading and math. We then decide who needs math or reading interventions. We give a, you know, a, about three or four weeks to figure out who needs the executive functioning interventions. Those are usually the kids that lockers are exploding and can't find any papers to hand in. And then we put them into academic interventions or enrichment, and then we run those weekly for nine or 10 weeks, and then we reassess. Do they still need that? Do they need something different? Do they not need anything? And then we move them into enrichment. And I inform the parents of the placement of where the children are if it's an intervention. So if their child's gonna receive an intervention, I let the parents know what that is. So every nine weeks or so, we look at the data and reassess. And uh, do, do the groups end up being small, is it four or five, 10 kids at a time? A they vary. Yeah. They can be anywhere from the intervention groups are smaller. The oh, enrichment imagine. groups, we push them up to 25, you know, in some cases 30 if we need to, but that's the in enrichment. Sure. The intervention blocks are less than 20 and in some cases less than 15 or 10. Gotcha. It just depends on the grade level. And so at each grade level we have two, well, 
two certified ELA in math teachers, but we also have duly licensed special education teachers, so mm -hmm. we can use them. So three at each grade level to provide interventions as needed. So it depends on the number of students. Gotcha. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's been a successful program. <laughs> Mr. McGowan. And just following up on that, um, how long have you been doing that? I think this is the fourth year. It came from NR, NRMS yeah. 2.0. So just over the course of the year, how does that play out? Do the intervention groups get smaller, or are they successful in that sense, or are they just constantly you're finding new needs? You're constantly needs? finding new needs. I would say perhaps that the level of intervention sometimes gets less, and we're just providing more remediate, remediate, remedial uh, interventions versus sometimes we're a couple of grade levels behind it some it will hopefully get that gap will close so that we're providing intervention just to get them right at grade level versus the more right. intense but it's more but it be it, but it's because there's new material being right. uh, introduced all the time it, it, that might trigger a, right. need, a, a need for intervention that wasn't exactly. there before and and I suppose the executive functioning that's that's that must be more observational in some in some ways than data driven or right. test result it's, driven. Right. It's more observational from the teachers too. We will yeah. say you know, also talking to parents, sometimes parents will call and say, Can you help you know, he's yeah. doing his homework or she's doing her homework, but then the teacher says she's not handing it in and the homeroom teacher might look in their locker and literally it's just they don't they don't know they haven't been taught to how to organize yeah. a binder, how to organize a locker so that they can you know, transition to the five different teachers in a day. Yeah, I, I remember with my son, when that switch flipped, it made all the difference in the world, so. Um, the other thing I was gonna mention was um, the climate surveys. Did you say you do, done them, do them every few years? You every year. Every, oh, you do are doing them every yeah. year, okay. Every year for students, and I let the parents know they can opt their, their students out, but yeah, okay. it, it's very, it's a benign survey about do you, you know, sure. feel supported at school? Do you feel safe at school? Yeah. Um, and 180, uh, I don't remember what the history is, but that's over 90% of the class yeah. uh, on the DC trip. That's, that's really excellent. They had a great time. They, had a fantastic they look like they're having a great time on yeah. Twitter anyway. It's a really wonderful experience. So the day trips were great too, and I didn't have an opportunity to publicly thank Brad Jones, but on Tuesday, a dozen students went to the State House, and he happened to be there, and he made them feel very special. Oh, that's great. Gave them, I thanked him, but not tonight, I wanted to acknowledge. He gave them, uh, you know, a really special tour, and, and they came home just beaming with the experience. It was pretty, pretty great. That's great. Hi, Dan. So, the climate and culture piece, I think, is so amazing that you're focused on that. And I know that you'll be looking at the data and putting together a plan in the fall. But even just to wrap my head around it even more, could you give examples both on the faculty side and maybe one on the student side? That you've done before that has been influential based on you know the data from prior years a simple thing that we yeah. did with the faculty is people said we don't see each other often because we're by teams sixth grade is very isolated upstairs so we made it's very simple but we created a bulletin board outside my office and encouraged people to share pictures personal pictures and celebrations in their life when the bulletin board is filled and now people are walking by because they have to go right by there every day to check their mailbox and they're talking and they're sometimes we have to say you know this is Susan's grandson or this is so-and-so's but it really I've had several people say but that made just a little different so that we can see you know oh her son graduated from college or right. her daughter got married we also uh, for the last couple of years one well actually two faculty meetings have done something pretty non-traditional this past spring, I worked with Amy Luckowitz, she's on my uh, school council, to create a North Reading Jeopardy game. Mm -hmm. So we all, you know, faculty meeting, but it was all questions about North Reading, about North Reading Middle School, and it's just a fun way to kind of, uh, not really collaborate, but come together with people that you work with in a, non, a little bit of a non-professional way. Right. Um, with students, we're really trying to include them in some of our decisions and some of the things we do in terms of the incentives for the positive behavior framework, asking them, so what, what would be valuable to, do, to you? What would be important to you? How can we you know, 
do things that mean something to you. So we're working with the peer leaders and student council to take their input to try to make sure their voice is heard. And, and one of the things they said last year is we, students said they didn't feel that students were acknowledged enough for good behavior. So we're trying to do something special on Friday mornings. We make an announcement for students who have received a green ticket and we make it, you know, announcement over the intercom and they get to come down and pick a prize, which is, you know, again, right. it's a small thing, but students have said that it makes a difference. Well, even being part of the decision, right? Even yeah. for adults, it's, you know, being part of the decision is, has a positive impact too. Yeah. Thank you. I have, I have one simple one. I, mean, I was going to comment on the climate survey as well, but it seems like we've all done that already. But um, a few years ago now, you had the whole, all, all the students read Wonder. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, I thought that, I just thought that was a really cool thing to do and, I, and people were talking about it. I mean, is there any plans to do something like that again? I, there, there is. I would love to do something like that again. It was so successful that I've been nervous to try to duplicate the <laughs> same experience. Yeah. So I'm trying to think that Mary Prenny, the, the um, senior center yeah. uh, director, I believe she's the senior center director, and I have had conversations because, if you recall, Wonder we did a yeah. we did a combined effort with some senior citizens. So Mary Prenny and I have talked about what it might look like if we combined forces again and and did something. So we're we're talking about it, but I don't have official plans for September. Yeah, and I, I, I know I've I've talked to some people, some seniors in the past, and I know they're excited to be in the yeah. school sometimes they're yeah. excited to be you know involved and just having the community it's like there's always this negative connotation about about kids and students and it's a great way to combat that and just you know having interaction between the groups and so and, and at another meeting they were talking about the how um, some students go to the senior center and help with technology things like that but I, I just think anything we can do to try to help the community interact with the students I is also agree. is good so we'll work on it Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Sure. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you for your time on the uh, search committee as well. Been I appreciate that. <laughs> happy to be a part of it. Back to the Thank you, Kat. continued business and try to get through. So, update on the superintendent's search process. Could Ms. Imbriano or Mr. McGowan provide an update? I'll be happy to, or you can if you like. Well, combine it. Um, oh. We had a meeting on the 13th where we kind of rifled through questions that we wanted to ask the applicant specifically in um, Rich's got them in line and we have um, uh, we were supposed to have interviews on Tuesday and Wednesday but that's been switched to Wednesday and Thursday so um, I've gotten some feedback from the group that they would like to have another day um, to sit down and discuss the applicants and then um, proceed to uh, give their recommendations to the school committee so um, I had spoke with mr. Bernard earlier about we have tentatively the 24th scheduled for the recommendations to come to the school committee but I'm thinking that we might postpone that so I will be reaching out to you guys so that you can respond with a date that you think would work better I mean even if it's just later in the week it could be like Wednesday or whatever um, to meet with them, but I would need to know pretty quickly so that we can let the applicants know. So, can, can I ask a couple of quick questions? So, just I mean, just to be transparent with the community, I mean, how many do you know how many applications we've received? And and secondly, what is the goal? Is the goal to just vet qualified candidates? Is the goal to do yeah. background checks? Is the goal to to get down to a narrow down to two? Yeah, it's you know, a great to commit to recommendations. What's the goal? Yeah, it's a good it's a good question. We don't we don't have a set number. Okay. 
we uh, received 15 applications. Um, and our goal was to go through them and decide who we thought was worthy of interviewing. So we didn't even really rank them or compare them. It was you know, this person, yes or no, this person, yes or no. Uh, what we ended up with was, and it was, I think it was a pretty easy consensus. I don't think there were any sharp divisions on either the yes sides or the no sides, so that was really good. Uh, we ended up with four candidates uh, in which we're going to interview. And similarly, I think the interview process, the goal is to, is to determine whether in each individual case, whether they deserve to be presented to the committee for further consideration. So we may end up with four, we may end up with two or one, we may theoretically end up with zero. I don't think that's going to happen, but it's possible. Um, so, but we're not committed to any course of action and we're not really, again, not really trying to rank or it's really on an individual basis at this point. I think that's, uh, I think, I think Janine, you, you can uh, chime in if you want, but I think Okay. We feel, and the, and the committee agrees, that it's really a, sort of that comparison against each other that's really up to the committee, the school committee. Uh, question. question for you guys. Uh, when you do your, I don't know if we'll call them preliminary interviews, but yep. when, you, when you conduct as a search committee these, these interviews, uh, how in-depth do you plan on going? Do you have an idea of, of, of kind of a... Uh, well, but there's 14 of us on the search committee, and I talked about the questions earlier and so each one chose a question that they want to ask the applicant. I see. So we'll have the same questions being asked to the applicants so that <clears throat> it's, you can compare apples to apples. Mm -hmm. um, and then from that we will. It's, it's tricky because it's uh, un unlike a, a, a interview process you might have in the private sector or, 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 or for uh, specific positions uh, even, uh, even in the schools. Um, because of the size of the committee and because of the nature of the process, we, there's, no, there's not really a lot of back and forth in the interview sure. process. It's, it's everyone gets the same experience. Right. Uh, we also have a lot of questions and we're trying to limit the amount of time. So we, they are, it's in depth in that sense. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of questions, so we'll have a lot of different ways to hear them, uh, hear the applicants respond and, sure. and judge, their respo judge their responses. So if, I think a, a good prepared applicant will, will uh, do well on these questions. So. And will the information from those questions become a transcript that we'll get, or is it simply just going to feed into your, your ideas about whether or not you, you want them to continue on to the next round? I don't think we've discussed we've that. We've not um, discussed that. Good, good um, question. Is that, I mean, because you guys are going to want to ask questions, <coughs> I'm assuming. Um, I, I, I tend to ask a few questions. Okay. <laughs> I mean, we could obviously uh, alert you to what those questions are. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, obviously, I, I don't think there's any precedent or reason one way or another that I'm aware of. So, yeah, I think uh, we can we can uh, have a discussion, obviously, in executive session. But, sure, uh, sure. Yeah. Can I ask you? Thank you. Um, are there any behavioral or emotional intelligence type questions incorporated, or is it highly technical? Just curious. There's emotional, yep. social learning. Um, questions, uh, it, it falls under fiscal, it falls under um, vision and leadership, it falls under technology and curriculum, and um, oh. the... Are you thinking more of, I'm, I'm of, of our... You think of the personality of the... the individual, so, their uh, own social... For the most part, they are professional. Yeah. Uh, the only, there are a couple of general questions, what we were calling general questions that are more along the lines of, um, uh, if I were to call up your superintendent uh, what would he say were your strengths or weaknesses uh, um, but nothing no. probably not the kind of thing you're talking about not yeah, situational no. like how would you handle X Y and Z yeah not, nothing is nothing quite situational like that there's there's some where we ask them to provide us examples of of, of how they have handled um, uh, a situation uh, yeah you, thing, know, uh, you know yeah initiatives have gone well that sort of thing but because um, yeah. sometimes the technical expertise is wonderful but you know, low emotional intelligence or certain I think what we'll be looking for, well, I shouldn't, I don't, don't want to go into too much more detail, but uh, I, I think there are opportunities for applicants to, to um, speak to that a little bit. Okay. I mean, I, obviously we defer to you guys because we trust you, but I would say it would, it would be helpful, even if it's not a full transcript, I think it would be helpful to have a, you know, especially if you put somebody forward to the school committee, have yeah. some pretty clear reasons why you think they're a good at candidate and any concerns that you, that have been addressed because 
again, you have 14 people from different varied backgrounds who were identified for specific reasons to be on there, and we don't have all that representation on this committee. And so I would, I would, you know, if something was raised by somebody, I would love to have that information because, you know, if it has has become part of the process, I think it should be handed on to us. No, I'm, I'm glad you brought it up because um, we probably would not have considered that, and, and I think we can do that. Yeah. Excellent point, Chris. Okay. I will also say that we have a really good group. Um, we, I, thanks to everyone's help here as well, we, we picked out a really good group of people, and, uh, and they've uh, uh, worked really well together. Awesome. Okay. Any other comments or questions on that? Okay. So now we're moving on to policy handbook. So there's a presentation and a vote here. So before you move on, yes. Sorry, do, do, Go ahead. I think the committee needs to vote to accept the school improvement plans. Oh, do we? School and high school, yes. Okay. It's just a vote to accept. So can I have a uh, motion? Would we want to do it separately? That's why we want to yes, do it separately. Yeah, so why don't we have a motion for the, to accept? I'll make such a motion to accept the high school's uh, improvement plan. I'll second. Okay, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. How about on the middle school? Chris? I'll make a motion for the middle school, too. Okay. Second. <laughs> uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. This is the new bids and donation team? Or Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> What's that? This is the new bids and donation team, the uh, <laughs> motions and the seconds? <laughs> okay, so now the policy handbook. So I have a number of questions and concerns about this, but I would love to hear from either Mr. Bernard or Mrs. Imbriano. Do you want me to start? Okay. I'd be happy to. So what you have before you is a, 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 a proposed um, insertion for the middle school and high school handbooks. Um, and just by way, I, I don't think, and I'll, I'll certainly let Ms. Imbriano speak to it uh, for herself, but I don't think the, the, the desire here is not to adopt a school committee policy. This is more in the code of conduct that governs each of those two schools. This is the language that, um, that we're seeking to have inserted. Um, and Back about um, six or so months ago, I think a small committee, a subcommittee of the Substance Abuse Coalition that is a kind of an offshoot of the community impact team came together, myself included, and, and Janine, who is the school committee's representative on the Substance Abuse Coalition, served on that committee, that subcommittee. We met eight, eight times? At least. Yeah, yeah. something like that. Um, with a group of other interested folks who were also members of the Substance Abuse Coalition to um, craft what you have in front of you um, is some language around how we might better serve students in a kind of a constructive, non-punitive manner when they find themselves in situations um, that are quote unquote <coughs> in the presence of alcohol. And so, you know, drafting something like this, and, and those of you that have served on the policy subcommittee, you know, know what I mean when I say it's hard, this is hard work. And so I think the reason we had to come together eight or so times for better than an hour each time, maybe even been more than eight, like I said, maybe 10, um, you know, I think did a nice job of, of, of working with, um, with me as the superintendent and therefore the one that was going to bring this back to the committee and the administration to give us some um, language that would allow us to work with students. Again, I want to emphasize this is and then the words were used many times by me in those meetings that I think if we can go an educational route and bring parents into the discussion too, that that would be a goal that you know I could certainly support. And so um, ultimately what we, we've done is, um, is we've, we've written up language that when a student at the middle school or the high school finds him or herself in the presence of alcohol, not in possession of, not having consumed, that they would be assigned to a, to a program known as diversion that would be drafted more specifically, I think if the committee sees fit to adopt this, um, that would allow us to, um, to edu better educate them about how putting themselves in situations like this can be can, 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 can jeopardize them. And so um, I think the language you have is self-explanatory. That's kind of the introduction. Janine, I don't know if you want to add anything, but um, if there are questions. Just, or? I guess, clarifying, too. I, 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 if they're found under the influence, the diversion also plays into that. Under the influence of or in possession. Right. right. So all of the current language of the student handbook would apply. Um, 
the only add-on to the any other. There's a, there are other penalties that students are are assigned, um, <clears throat> or could be assigned depending upon the situation, um, for being in the possession of or under the influence of alcohol. School event. There could be some athletic sanctions. There could be some extracurricular activity partic participation sanctions. That kind of thing. But the diversion component would also be would also be a part of that. And I think one of the things that is key too here is in the in the third paragraph under the heading of diversion is that um, the determination of this would be through a police report. And that was because the subcommittee worked very hard to come up with language that would avoid situations where, well, you know, I'm at a family party, I'm in the presence of alcohol, but, but there's nothing, you know, that's not an unsupervised, you know, um, uh, social host law violation. This is a situation where the police have been called and, and have have arrived at a location where there unfortunately might be a number of youth that are in the presence of alcohol and the police report generated would indicate that. Is that fair? So I, I have uh, one question about this, which is uh, in, in keeping what you just said, that this is specifically uh, for people that weren't covered by a policy earlier, people that are not drunk and are not in possession but just happen to be I don't want to say happen to be, but are at a location mm -hmm. uh, that becomes an issue. And is there something to be said for kids who provide? Uh, maybe this is uh, there is no research to back this up. It's just it's just a, a curiosity of mine. Kids providing a positive peer pressure influence. Kids that are around a party but aren't making poor choices, mm -hmm. and that perhaps are. Uh, realistically maybe making sure that certain kids don't get into a car drunk mm -hmm. or maybe don't go too far and are kind of helping to use their social pull to to swing things in a more positive direction um, and again that might be you know fiction but just it, no, it's in, that, in that idea you know are we now telling that kid get out of there it's a very and leave it's those kids to it's not it's not fiction it's a, it's a very real point that we talked about over a couple of meetings so I'm glad you raised it we and I'll speak for myself, I, sure. was, I would, did not want to be in a posi position where we were discouraging students who may be called by a friend to show up and help get them out of a bad situation. Sure. And in the end, I think where we yeah. fell was, but what we're asking for the student and a parent to do, and again, conceptually, this is what we've talked about, is what the diversion program would look like. We're looking for you to attend a two-hour kind of educational program. And so if that's, you know, there's no, there's no judgments, there's no school-based discipline, we would hope that there would be no home discipline. Um, so again, we, we fell on the side of, well, this is what we're asking you to do, and we don't see that as being, you know, a, a punitive implication. And for the, you know, I don't know how often something like that would happen, but it might. Sure. And I, I can appreciate as an adult that, that it, you could spin it as not being punitive, but I would imagine that any kid that's told your name was on a police report, and even though we don't feel you did something wrong, we want to make sure you go to this educational program, and if you don't, you're going to be suspended for a period of time. It, it, I feel like it's impossible to toe that line without it coming across as punitive. Yeah, I don't. Okay. I don't see it as impossible. Okay. I, you know, I, I hear your point, but sure. I don't. I don't see, think it's. I don't see it as impossible. Um, okay. But it, it 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 could. You know, we're asking you to give up two hours in the evening or two hours on a Saturday. So yeah, I hear you. Sure, Mr. McGowan. So. Um, diversion program, we don't know what that program is. I, I would say to you, yes, the short answer to your question is yes. We do not know what that looks like yet. What I can tell you conceptually we've talked about is that something would be offered probably here um, six or so times a year where a, a student and the parent would have an option to go and, and you know, we would do it, talked about doing it in such a way that, you know, there may be a Thursday evening and a Saturday morning option in a given, in a given week's time. And you know, pick the one that your schedule can work right. with. You know, we did. I did. I did speak pretty pointedly back four or so meetings ago, and you'll see the little. There's a little note at the end <clears throat> that I think that there needs to be some um, some discretion. I mean, I spoke <clears throat> about situations that I'm very well aware of, where if a, if a student were very innocently in a situation where you know, it, it, just getting to a diversion program may, be, may not be possible right now for a family, and I think that there needs to be some out for that. I wouldn't expect that that would be exercised, and I don't know that this would even be exercised that, all that often. When I think back of my, you know, what will, you know, coming up on 16 years in North Reading, the times that I've received a police report as an administrator where students were in the presence of and not in the possession of or under the influence of is, is very minimal. It's 
it's, I, I, don't know, I don't know if I could put numbers on two hands, maybe a hand, you know? Um, and I'm not expecting that all of a sudden there's gonna be this flurry either. I think what we're trying to do is just, you know, as, as is one of the kind of the missions of the community impact team is to kind of help kids make good decisions and sometimes they need a little sit down educational moment to, to make that happen. And, you know, even though you may not have consumed alcohol right now, or, you know, but was it likely that this party that you were at with 40, 50, 60 kids, you know, was going to turn into something that could be quite ugly and maybe this is going to head it off? You know, that, that's, I think, the overarching hope. Mm -hmm. so, but conceptually, I think that's what we were talking about. Kind of, Jeannie, am I right? Like a two-hour type thing that there would be some sort of an exit ticket, you know, a reflection piece at the end. We're asking a parent to accompany the student um, to the program, too. Um, but those are the kinds of things that have been talked about. How do you propose responding to a parent who's not responsive, as opposed to the child not being responsive? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that we wouldn't be there, but it's possible. You know, again, I, I'm hoping that they would assume that responsibility. So uh, it's most important that the child be there, I think. But I, I, mean, I would hope we would get the support of the parent in yeah, that of situation. Course. Yeah, I just yeah. want to make sure that we. Yeah, it's a good question. Just want to make sure yeah. we don't. Penalize the child. Yeah. The parent won't. Participate. Yeah, I wouldn't see that. Yeah. yeah, I wouldn't see that being. I wouldn't. I certainly wouldn't want that to be the case. Yeah. So I, I have a lot of comments and concerns with this, with this policy. So, um, so I, I just want to start by saying, I mean, I appreciate the substance abuse coalition and the work they're trying to do. I appreciate trying to address underage drinking. I think that addiction starts at a young age. I don't think. I mean, I was an RA for a number of years when I was in college and. One of the main problems we faced was underage drinking, and we learned a lot about, you know, how how alcoholism begins, and it, it's 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 a serious concern. Um, however, I think that this policy is is not is not appropriate. Um, I think that first and foremost, it, it it is not illegal to be in the presence of alcohol, um, and the way that this is this is drafted right now, I think that it has two big concerns. I think that number one, it extends the reach of the schools into areas where it should not be. It's one thing to regulate things that happen in the school or on school grounds or at school activities, but this one tries to say, well, we're not regulating it in July in, the, in your home, but we are regulating in October in your home because school is in session. And I, I actually, I did, my, when I was, got nearly 20 years ago, I did a thesis in college on student free speech rights. and. The law at that point in time, and that might have changed since then. There were, there has to be some nexus to the school in order to have regulation, and so I, I'm very concerned that I, I frankly don't know that this is even would if this was challenged would even be legal. Um, but it, even if it could be, I just think that it's extending. And when we say, well, there's going to be reason, you know, common sense used and reason used. <laughs> I mean, technically, if you have a graduation party and there's alcohol there and it gets loud and the police show up and there's a noise violation, that's an official police report. And any student that is there is in the presence of alcohol at that point in time. And you can go beyond and you can say, okay, well, there's 50, there's a party with 50 kids there and 45 are drinking, five are not. But you could have a party with 50 kids and five of them are drinking. You know, they brought flasks in and then the other 45 are in the presence of alcohol right now. And I just think it's, I think it's overly broad. I don't think it's narrowly tailored. I think it's going beyond school ground. It's going into, you know, the private home and, while I understand the goal is to try to educate children, the goal is to try to address underage drinking, to address addiction. I just, I mean, the school is not a, we're, we are not police. And I, I don't believe we should be responsible for what's happening outside of school times, outside of school grounds, outside of, you know, school activities. And I just think this policy goes far too far beyond what it should be. Um, and not to mention again, the, the being in the presence is not, if a police officer saw, saw a student that was near somebody else that was drinking, they're not doing anything actually illegal at that point in time or wrong. So I have, I have serious concerns with, with the policy changes. So that's my thoughts and open it up for our other discussions. I just, I, I think I've n neglected to add something too that one of the first, maybe even the first meeting or prior to us meeting, um, a number of other school districts were contacted about what their policies look like, and there was a fair number that have mm -hmm. a similar type of a program. Would you agree? Diver yeah. Speaking to diversion, the yeah. social probation piece. Just for I'm just yeah. giving you that yeah, for sure. informational purposes. So, I'd like to add uh, something to that. Uh, I'll echo what Scott said about 
uh, how great it is that we're, as a community, trying to work with teen drinking. And, and that's certainly a challenge that uh, every high school faces. Uh, I had a, a couple of students that uh, in, in Wakefield a few years ago who were in an accident and died the weekend after, uh, the weekend before graduation. Um, uh, very recently. So it's something that whether we want the school to go into the home or not, the kids go to school and this is a, 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 a convenient place to kind of help educate them and, and help them make sure they make good choices. One, one question I have, John, is as you imagine the, or as we imagine the diversion program being, how different is the content in, in that session from what is already annually or regularly shown to kids just when speakers come or yeah. when, when these things are addressed? Yeah, I don't, I don't know that it's starkly different because, again, we haven't gotten to a point where we know exactly right. what the curriculum is going to be. But I don't want to, you know, we, we've talked about what, what it might look like and who would be involved in that presentation. We've also talked about if we are successful in crafting what we hope to craft, which I'm optimistic that we would, it might even be something we would introduce into our health program at the high school. So stu every student would eventually, you know, again, conceptually, if we crafted a two-hour module that this diversion program is, is that something that could be introduced in grades nine and 10 health classes over two classes, an hour each one? So now every student is getting that as kind of a, you know, a pre-message before something right. even happens. Um, I mean, we do these kind, you know, a lot of, I think, what we, what we talk about in schools, whether it's through guest speakers or through health classes, is covered. But this would be a more focused, I think, kind of intensive with a parent, you know, led by someone trained to, to introduce them to, you know, skills that might help them to make a decision that's better the next time or help them get out of a situation when maybe something could go wrong. Is there a feeling that if we just offered those to the community as a whole, that without the incentive of you have to attend this because of, of, of some behavior that we've witnessed, that they just won't be attended? And You know, that's a fair question. Um, I, you know, I, I've worked here a long time, and we've done a lot of anti-drinking and driving or anti-chemical health uh, abuse programs. I, I think those have made a difference. I, I really do. Um, but I think there's just a need for doing more. And I think, you know, we've kind of, you know, a lot of the programs that AJ spoke to today were about decision making, healthy decision making that go on uh, in, the, in the presentations to the students in the schools. I, you know, I just, I think, I think we continue to grapple with, you know, just the, 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 the risk that sometimes goes along with being, you know, 16, 17, 18 years old, or maybe even younger now. Um, I think you might see, if this were to be adopted and it were to, to be implemented successfully, I could see that <laughs> in a year, someone might be sitting here talking to you about extending this to vaping as a problem that we're seeing more of among young people. And is there a way that we can, you know, have a more focused um, conversation with them and a parent about why this is not good for you? Um, because that's something we're seeing mm -hmm. an uptick in, unfortunately. Huge one, yeah. Yeah, you know, well, you're right. You, you see, you know it because you're, you're living it too. But um, so I think, I think we've, we've come to a place where um, the concern remains that we know that sometimes there are those students that are just going to the place, and, and I, ha I still believe in my heart that there are those kids. They're all good kids, but some of them make better decisions than others, you know? And I, but I, and I do want to still believe, and I do believe that there are some kids that are just in the wrong place at the wrong time, or, or, or go and, because that's what's going on, and I'm not going to do the wrong thing, but I just, you know, I'm going because it's the social event of the weekend or something. But, sure. you know, that's... We're, we're, I think we just have to try something different that for those kids that you know find themselves in a situation where alcohol is there and encourage them that they just they need to get themselves out of there right away and this is you know one way that we're hoping to attack that I, I, Janine I don't know my, I'm kind of trying to capture mm -hmm. you know the, the months of work on it it's hard I know I hear the concerns I do Janine would tell you because she sat in the meetings with me that I voiced a lot of what mm -hmm. is being talked about now but in the and I think I feel like that was heard. And in the end, you know, this this started out as something much more, much larger than it is tonight. Believe me, um, I felt like this was something that the administration could 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 support. You know, the principals and the assistant principals and me um, before we brought it to you. 
Um, but there were some, you know, there were, you know, and this isn't a bad thing, and I don't mean to be flippant about it, but, you know, a lot of people want to save the world, you know, and I respect that, but at the same time, you have to kind of boil it down to what's reasonable and acceptable and, and can be tolerated and, and can be achievable. And I think this, this I think, could be achievable. Um, at least I'm hopeful that it could be. Diana? I just had a question. Um, I don't know the handbook mm -hmm. thoroughly, so is there something similar for illegal substances? I know you mentioned vaping, obviously that isn't there, but illegal substances, like in the presence of like um, a like a marijuana or yeah. not Christ, there isn't no there isn't. right right now I think um, not not for not for a diversion program but no. but if you there are there there are penalties okay yes there are okay. penalties for, for for not for in the presence of Got there it. are penalties for um, usage possession or use okay. correct and, okay. but and, but is that in the, uh, on school grounds and not, school not, activities not necessarily it's okay. both no. it could be but you is could it, you is could it be, outside of school time you could be a student yeah. you could be a student in Middleton. Mm -hmm. in possession of alcohol. And if that makes its way to North Reading, um, you know, by way of a police report or some other means, you know, that, that is verifiable, mm -hmm. that student's likely sanction is, um, um, you know, aside from any criminal thing that might be going on, out, you know, outside of the school's uh, purview, is likely to be a, um, a, a, a sanction of, participation in athletics or extracurricular activities. It could be, it could, depending again, to, you know, every situation is a little bit different as you might imagine, but it could be, you know, could jeopardize a student standing in the honor society, national honor society if the student has been enrolled. So there are those, those kinds of things. It may not necessarily, uh, it may or may not necessarily be any kind of a suspension from school okay. or, or more severe. Again, right. it depends on what the situation is. But if, we, if we're talking about just a, you know, um, a student, a student is 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 driving in another community, and is a case of beer in the back seat. Just as an example, um, then a lot of what I just talked to you about would, would be the likely the likely punishment. And just to to follow on that, I know is it just the concept of not wanting to boil the ocean on why we're starting with alcohol versus also having the same program for being in the presence of an illegal substance? I think the focus became alcohol because that's mm -hmm. kind of the thing where struggling the most with. I, okay. I, think, I think there are some Experience. people, yeah, no, it's a fair question because I, I, I feel confident in saying to you that I think there are some people that would have probably liked to be to more encompassing. Yeah. Yeah. And I, 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 pro, I really, quite honestly, I but felt like this was where I thought we needed right, to start. start. Somewhere. And it doesn't mean right. that we can't come back. And I think it's very likely, I don't, you know, I, I don't know this, but I think it's very likely you might see the yeah. whole concept of diversion. Is to educate people right. so that they they know before something and bad. So like, why wouldn't we apply it to they'll other They'll be things? educated on this policy so they're aware of it. Before. So yeah, so that's a, that's another good question. It's something we've talked about. And again, it, you know, I don't know where it's going to go right now. But if if we do include this in our handbooks, I think um, what we've done in the past to market, so to speak, a or advertise a change of you know something of any, of some magnitude is it's usually. Um, covered in a, an opening day packet of materials that goes, that goes out to families. It would be covered in an opening day assembly with students, you know, face to face with the administration. I committed to the group that if it happened, I would be sending out my emails, you know, the, the ones you all get, uh, the Blackboard Connects, you know, this is a change for 2019, 20, you know, that kind of a thing. Um, you know, I would, I would be looking to Jill, you know, to advertise that this is something that's coming for all the right reasons, you know. Um, that we just don't want to be in a situation where we didn't know that this was new this year. You know, we would make we would make every effort to, much like we did years ago when we changed the target policy. This is very different, but in in the world of a school, that's a big deal when you change the tardy policy. You know, that affects a, probably a lot more kids. You know, um, but we would commit to, to advertising that. I know this is you know I believe me I've I've kind of held my nose with this too at times and been like oh, I just you know but I think I think we're trying to do something creative and. And, you know, for positive, for lack of a better word. So, so just to recap a little bit, um, yeah. just speaking to, Scott, your concerns. Um, so right now, if in this same police report, any student who is identified as under the influence or, influence or in possession of alcohol would be subject to penalties 
and this would be regardless of the time of year or only during the school year or it would be it would be the same as this the the, the handbook now states from that first official day of fall within practice the, to within yes the, within the school or athletic school year uh, boundaries at our last meeting last tuesday i think it was we spoke very specifically about what you just said that it could be a div i think i used the term it could be a divided police report you know there could be x over here that might be a something more severe and then there could be y over here which is in the presence of but there could be a, a student that you know had possession or, or was under the influence right. of so, and and but they are subject so from that same police report they are subject to um, the school uh, sanctions correct yeah. yeah that would be the that so would be the the intent in that sense this isn't um obviously that level of severity is quite a bit greater but the 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 how it came to our attention is essentially the same. Correct. Although, although the police report is not, you'll see that it's emphasized here, and that came out of our last meeting. And I would add, by the way, that the police chief was at the, the meeting, um, the last meeting, and, and the school resource officer attended not all, but most of the yeah. other meetings. Um, so there was police involvement as well, yep, of in course, weighing in on this. But I think um, the point I wanted to make, Rich, about what you were just saying completely left my head in about about 10 seconds ago. police report oh the police thank you it was an important one i knew that the police report is not is only needed to support the identification of a students in the presence <coughs> of we're not suggesting everything else stays the same right now we a student could be held culpable for for some other evidence that supports their being under the influence of or in possession of <coughs> I, it, it doesn't oh, necessarily have to be a police and it, report. And it's only, and this policy only speaks to a police report. If, if, if we become aware of a Facebook <laughs> picture, not that any kids on Facebook anymore, mm -hmm. of a kid being in the presence, oh, Correct. there is this child in the presence of this party, which clearly is, is, is a, is a mm -hmm. problematic party. Right. That's not something we would uh, Correct. Um, That's not implement this policy. I will, I will tell you what I've had in the past is I have had pictures made available to me anonymously. Yeah, I'm sure. What I've done is I've contacted the parent and I've let them know that they're available in my office for them and come to see them. Okay. Because I didn't feel like it was, <clears throat> I didn't want to just dismiss them, but the photos, the photos don't provide, and it's been determined that yeah. they don't provide the kind of evidence to take action like that. Yeah. Diana? So I was just putting this in like practical settings. So you know we've all been in high school and um if you're at a large party and there's alcohol right and the police come and they write down everyone's name i don't remember breathalyzers for every child to say who was drinking versus who was not so it was mm -hmm. really word of mm -hmm. your own word right mm -hmm. to say i was not or mm -hmm. i was i don't actually know whether or not now they document what someone's word is each individual child so when you think about that and you find out that 45 kids were at a party, you know, does a police report really get to the granularity of who's drinking versus who's not? Or do you go by word of mouth? Or? Yeah, no, you, we would go by what the police write. But I, I will say that, again, it was discussed at one of our meetings about the availability of the breathalyzers, right? Janine's shaking her head. I mean, we talked about the okay. police, you know, having that availability there to make the determination that you are or are not under the influence of. Right. Or having been. Um, you know, consumed. It's almost, that. if you flip it on its head, because back in the day, everyone would get in trouble, everyone would get written up, and everyone would have the harsher repercussions. Right. The fact that you have diversion because you can <clears throat> determine that you are not drinking, you have much lesser severity in your... Like just being in the presence. Right, right. 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 So right. if you could flip that on its head and say it's almost beneficial to those kids that were there and not drinking because they don't have to just fall in that bucket that's, that's, of those that's certainly repercussions. A, that's a perspective, yeah, nope. absolutely. Uh, again, I mean, I... I I, I appreciate the concern. I appreciate trying to do something, but I still don't think we're the party to do that. I still think when, when I, I looked through the handbook at the mention of alcohol, everything about alcohol talked about possession and it talked about use of, and it talked about on school grounds at school activities during the school day. We are, we are proposing extending the, the oversight of the schools beyond school activities, beyond the school day, beyond the school grounds, into a private home when there's no connection to the school. We are also proposing having- Well, that still having exists now. That still exists now. 
but we, but we're and we're also in in what respects? Because when I looked at all the alcohol, it talked about it didn't it talked about at school activities, school events. No, the the the, 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 like the consequence for it being on a school on school grounds or at a school event is is there's likely going to be a suspension from mm -hmm. school tied to that. There wouldn't necessarily be if it was it was happened in <coughs> someone's home. The I understand the MIAA has different response different like MIAA oversees the athletics, and so there can be athletic suspensions, things like that. But again, I mean, I think it's 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 expanding the powers and. Again, the students are not actually breaking a law. They're not doing anything illegal when they are in the presence of alcohol. And even from tonight's discussion, it seems clear that it's trying to get, you know, one thing in, and then it's going to be added to vaping. Then it's going to be then the penalties could be increased. You know, there could be penalties instead. I mean, I, I just think it's a slippery slope. I, I I don't think we should go there. I, I just think I, I understand that there. Are, I I know some of the background of why this is trying to come about, and I understand that there's very good reasons for this, and I understand that the police may be limited in some of the actions that they can take, and they would love the schools to be able to step in and be able to have some education or some sort of regulation of this, but I just don't think that's our function, and I think the way that it's drafted is is concerning to me, and just the overall the overall intent is concerning, and, and, it's, and again, nothing is trying to say we shouldn't be educating students about this. They're if we hear something, if we want to have something at school for them, you know, to, if, if we hear this is happening, if it's vaping, if whatever it is, we should be addressing it. We have every right and obligation to be trying to do what we can, but regulating things that happen outside of the school that are not illegal, prohibited activities, it, it's, a, it's, it's a line that I'm, the, I'm personally not willing to cross. And ultimately, again, I'm one vote out of five, and a four out of five or three out of five disagree with that I, I appreciate that but again that that's where I stand on this I just it, maybe it's a lawyer in me I just I, I just think it's an extension of our our authority I think it's a regulation and I just worry about what this is going to become if we if we do this so that's that's my thoughts on it um, but we do have a motion here so I think we should at least uh, other Can I have one last yes, question uh, John um, currently for kids that are uh, caught during the school year, but outside of um, school hours and school grounds, when they're caught drinking by police or, or some other respected method of uh, verification, what type of education do they go through as part of their ramifications for that? Yeah, very minimal. Okay. Really, I mean, it's a conversation with the administration, but it's not. It's no. There's no program. Sure, um, because it. it this this it, would be I, a program. I, right. Although this would be a program arguably for the kids that made, if not good decisions, not quite as bad decisions as Correct. Well, it would be others. both. Oh, this would be... If you, were, if you were in possession or under the influence, you would also be subject to diversion. I see. In addition to any other yeah. sanctions. Sure. Right. <clears throat> okay. Thank you for clarifying sure. that. I just need to ask yeah. you a question to make a decision yeah. um, as a lawyer. Yeah. So is, oh. if you're, no, if you are a minor and you're at a party with other minors and you are not drinking, but you are there and the police come, you are not going to get in trouble by the police for being at that party? My understanding, I'm not a, I'm not a criminal lawyer, so I'll right. I'm just put curious, that out there. I, mean, I know you said it wasn't against. My, my under, yes, law. my understanding of everything is, yes, it's not illegal to be in possession. I mean, if I have, whether it's students there, I mean, there are, there are social host laws that, that go after, that target people that are providing alcohol to minors. There's rules about drinking. Um, but it, no, my understanding from everything that I've seen, and I, was, I did speak to a lawyer the other night who may or may not have been in school committee in the past to get their thoughts as well. But they, again, everything that I've understood is that there is nothing illegal about being in the presence of alcohol. I mean, if, and again, I mean, the way that this is drafted right now, there could literally be, there could be a party of 50 kids. Five of them could have alcohol there, you know, and, and the other 45, there's no intent here. There's no knowledge requirement within this policy. Like there's nothing that says that they even knew that the other five kids were drinking. And yet they are in the presence of alcohol. If the police show up, and you know, again, if if, if adults, if you have a party, if you have a graduation party, and you're loud, and the police show up, and they say it's rowdy, and they document who's there, any student is there that is, is in the presence of the alcohol of, of alcohol. And again, I, I understand why people are trying to do this, but I just I, I think our job as a committee is to you know, look at where the lines are drawn and, and establish the protocols. And I just think this is, 
this is extending it beyond. I mean, the police, the police, if somebody shows up, they, they can't arrest them for being there. Like they could, they could do enough, they could provide um, a, a breathalyzer. They could take statements from witnesses that said, I saw them drinking. They could see them in possession, but just being in the party does not get you arrested from my understanding of, of the law. So, and again, I mean, this is, it, it's, it's not lost on me. And like, I, I hate drinking and driving in particular. I mean, like I'm, I'm a, I just, I just worry that we're extending beyond what we should be doing. And so, and that, that's, and by all means, I'm not trying to, I'm just trying to express my concerns and my, my thoughts about it, but you know, everybody should vote what they, what they believe. I just, that, that's where I'm coming from on my thoughts. I wonder if the committee would entertain a motion to table this discussion <coughs> for till the next meeting. I mean, do we need a vote on this right now or? I mean, I think we have a discuss we have a, a discussion point and a request for a vote on the agenda. <clears throat> so I think we should either have I mean, that it, vote or vote to table it. But I mean, maybe there's maybe there's a maybe there's a version that addresses other people's because I mean, I I'm concerned about the overall subject matter, but also the language of it. I mean, if people want to vote down the specific language, if we want to pass over it, I mean, I'm I'm open to whatever. I mean, I, I'm just not in favor of the handbook changes as presented tonight. So. John, what time, when would we need to have made a decision yeah, in order I mean, we'd have for to the have a, handbook to be printed? The, 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 if, if the committee came to a decision in July that want, they wanted to adopt this or some version of it, it wouldn't, it likely would not be printed in the handbook, but that's not a, it doesn't mean it can't be, it can't be instituted for 2019-20. It just, it would have to go out as a supplement, that's all. The goal of bringing it tonight was to, to try to get it in time for the handbook be, to be printed, but I wouldn't certainly don't want that to be a, a dry, if there's reservation, I don't want that to be a driving force. We can, can work I, around um, that. All right, the, the, the whole rationale behind this was, there was a situation where there was a lot of students involved in a party and the police did show up and names were taken down. But because it did not indicate who had alcohol and who didn't, the school, the, the police didn't dis, um, dis, whatever, um, dissinuate between um, and because we don't have anything currently like this, we weren't able to reach out to those students to help educate them. So if this was to go into play, so it, what I'm trying to say is some kids who were actually, you know, drinking and were drunk and versus the ones that were just there as, you know, side, side lights or even to pick someone up and drive them home. In the words of some parents, they all got off the hook. And the police <coughs> would like to be able to help them. And this is the best way to do that, is if their name appears on the police station, um, the police report, then we would reach out to them in diversion to help them to make better choices in the future. And, and, and so that no one gets- I would, I would put a little different spin on it. It was, it, was, it was my saying that I wanted the school department to have an option okay. to help them. And it, and it went to an, taking an educational route as opposed to a punitive route. That's the only correction I would make. Okay. But I'm just, so it's not, you know, you're having a family barbecue and you play the music too loud, the police, obviously you have common sense too as if they were to go there and they see that yeah there's a bar set up but the kids are over here playing and the adults are here they're not going to write you up but 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 with all due respect that's not what the policy says i mean the right now i understand that where the rules are the line is here and there's one thing they want to try to regulate over here but to draw the line all the way around that you are grabbing a lot of other events there is nothing that is in here that says if the parents are having a party and the police show up and the police report is by the noise that those kids are not in the presence and not going to have that. And there are other, I mean, if, 
if a large majority of the senior class was at that party, there's no reason at all that the school cannot have an educational program that next Monday or a week afterwards for everybody to attend. But, and, and that's, a, that's an alternative way to address it. And my concern is just draw, trying to draw the line to, to grab that one instance. You grab a lot of other instances which, which are concerning to me. And, and that's, that's my concern with it, is that it's overly broad, it's not a narrowly tailored policy, and again, that's part, part of it, and then just overall, in the presence is different. I mean, if there's a way to educate, if there's an interview process to figure out who was actually drinking, and people you know, anonymously right. can uh, say that, but, but that's uh, different. And, and, and clearly, that's a different situation. Yeah. But the question is, should we be addressing those who are deemed to be at, at you know, in, yeah. in the presence of? That's really the question. We we know that yeah. well. We know that one way or other, there are some uh, uh, repercussions for being in in, uh, in possession of under the uh, influence the, of or in possession of. Um, it's really, I mean, your point I think is should we uh, be addressing uh, those who are deemed to be um, in the presence of through a systemic policy as opposed to, hey, we need to ramp up our education efforts uh, across the board yeah. or institute an, ex an extra education event. Um, I mean, I'm struggling with it, so I, 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 I don't know how I feel about it. Uh, yeah. um, anyway, it's, not, it's not easy for me either. I mean, I, I, again, I, I understand the intent, and again, part of me says that if there's anything we can do to educate that helps you know, one student not drink and drive or not drinking, you know, and then there's an accident later on or someone, you know, drinks too much and it, it, I, I, I hear that, but again, the, the, I, I'm a firm believer in due process and things like that and I just feel like our job today is to not draw, draw the line where it's, in, it's, it's encapsulating a lot of other situations that are not intended. And so I just don't, I don't think this policy addresses it, so. Again, I mean, I, I don't know if we want to vote on the specific motion here, if, if people want to pass it over, but I, I don't know what people would like to do. I mean, I would, I mean, Chris, Rich, Janine, Diana, thoughts? I mean, okay. um, well, I, I would think that it would be good to find out exactly where we stand on this motion and then whether or not it's worthwhile to, well, either we'll move forward with it or if not, uh, should we try and, and, uh, alter it to find a way that, that a majority of us find to be appropriate. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. certainly, right. certainly, I guess we should find out. We, we, we've already, you know, I, I think yeah, we have I a think, feeling. I think, you know, I think a lot of people did put a lot of work into this, and so I don't, I personally would probably rather not pass it over and just say, like, on this that's actual fair. motion. That's fair, yeah. You know, like, this is our thoughts. It doesn't mean that if another motion comes up that, or another language comes up, I mean, again, I have concerns beyond just the language because I don't know how to address it. I'm not sure. smart enough to think about how I could find a way to do both of them. But, I mean, I would think we should take a motion on just the language that's here tonight and kind of go from there. But that, that's where I, I would think. But I don't know. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think we should yeah. do that. I'll just say one more thing. Yeah. My concern... I have a little bit of some of that concern of the broad net. Mm -hmm. I also, even though this, the, the um, repercussions here of, of not a failure to attend diversion are fairly mild. Again, I, that's, where, that's where I'm a little bit drawing, a, a, a struggling that, that there should be any repercussions at all of, as you say, something that's, that's not. Um, not illegal. That they haven't been gotten in, not, they haven't done anything wrong necessarily. So, um, even though this is very mild and and it's, I don't I don't think it's good enough to say well it's an easy it's easy they just have to go through the diversion program and yeah. they won't have any repercussions. Um, Fair enough. I mean I, I as a no oh, sorry I thought you were done. yeah no I, <laughs> I yeah and so that's I, that's an area that I would even though it would take teeth, as it were, out of that, the policy, that's where I would feel more like it, that this kind of, that this event, this appearance in a police report triggers a learning, uh, 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 an education effort, I think is not necessarily inappropriate. 
um, uh, how how that should play out in terms of first offense, failure to attend diversion, et cetera, I don't know. And, and the other thing is, you know, it doesn't really address, I don't, maybe it does. What if you're on, th what if it happens on three different occasions that you're at a party but only deemed to be in, in, in uh, you know, yeah. at the party where there is alcohol? I mean, yeah, it's not clear on that. I, I, I mean, I think, and I thought you made an excellent point earlier about the, if the parent doesn't come and then, then there is teeth to it if you don't show up to the diversion, if you're a parent or you don't show up to it. Um, and, and by all means, I mean, when I was growing up, my parents' rule was, you're at a party and they're drinking, you call me and you leave that party, right. because I would be in trouble yeah, if they yeah. found out about that. But that's yeah. the parent regulation. That's not no, the school doing it. That is, but uh, that, that touches on, on my, I think my, my key issue uh, of this is that uh, kids who are in the presence of alcohol I think it's very foreseeable that they're making poor choices there, but it also could be the other way. It, I'm not convinced that somebody is exercising poor judgment if they're at a social event underage where other people are doing this and they are there, and that's all the information I have. And as a result, I feel overly cautious about wanting to think that, uh, that they need to be compelled towards additional supports. Um, I think that Having education for for uh, kids is a great thing. Having it for these issues and having that go to all kids, or making parents aware, like as you brought up, this is rooted in a particular incident that happened, and had that were that to happen again, and saying to all parents, it's not a matter of you got off the hook or not, but if you're concerned about your kids, we offer this, and you can come with them and 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 learn more about these things. But compelling them, um, I feel is uh, not the best direction to go into. Okay. So why don't we have a motion to, I guess we'll have a motion to accept the policy handbook, and then we can, so we, by putting the motion forward and seconding it, we're not agreeing to it, then we'll make the vote afterwards. Oh. So we can have a motion to. Are you making the motion? Yeah, no, go, go ahead. Sure, motion to accept uh, this policy as written. I'll second. Okay. Okay, any more discussion on this? So, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. Nay. Nay. Uh, abstentions? Anybody? So it's, uh, so it's voted down four to one? Yeah. Okay, so fails to pass four to one. And, and again, I know people will be upset about different things, but I, I appreciate the discussion today from, from the committee. I mean, I appreciate the thoughtful comments and thoughts, and I know it's challenging, it's a challenging issue, but. And John, I always, my priority is to support the administration and the things they put forward. I think that if intent and awareness can be taken into consideration, um, as well as the ability to implement something like this, for example, like breathalyzers being standard, we can't promise that. So, you know, it turns to word to mouth, just even the example that Janine said. So I appreciate that. we can look at that. Yeah. Um, I don't sure. think it's, I don't, I don't feel like it should be dead in the water because I think there should be more innovative we'll ways to do continue to do some good work, I promise you. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I totally agree with that and other people have said it, but I, I think I totally commend the group on the work. It, it, they, did, they did nice work. It's valuable Intent work. Intent was good. It's valuable work and it will, con and it should continue and we'll, we'll, we'll yeah. Agreed. The idea of educating kids that are to, to make the right choices is maybe the most important thing to come out of high school with. It is one of the, what yeah. we're all about. It's key. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so let's move on. Food Service Workers Collective Bargaining Agreement. So we need a vote tonight on this. Um, Mr. Connolly, do you want me or you to sure. do the... Um, you yeah, do I'm the? happy to offer some comments. Okay. So, um, so myself, and I appreciate the the assistance of um, Chairman Buckley, who uh, served on the um, Collective Bargaining Committee, and I think it was a very, you know, amicable, um, you know, very you know, good process with the members of the Food Service Workers Collective Bargaining Union. Um, and I think we came to um, an agreement, um, and these are sort of the, the highlights of that agreement. It would be a three-year contract that would begin July 1st, 2019 through June 30th, 2022. Um, it included some adjustments to the language around the clothing allowance. Um, so they, they're, they currently receive a clothing and a shoe allowance. So this would um, 
actually reduce their, their clothing allowance um, and the district would actually purchase uniform tops um, and actually aprons for the employees as opposed to them purchasing and receiving an, an allowance uh, to do that. Um, so that was a change that we, we felt uh, positive uh, about and, and through some healthy dialogue and conversation, I think the, the food service workers involved um, you know, felt pretty good about it as well. Um, another key highlight was the addition of some professional development offerings to the food service workers on days that staff receive professional development. So these would be the half days, early release days. There's oftentimes lunch is not served in the district. So in a lot of cases, that was sort of a loss of a, an opportunity to have a work day. Um, on those days, uh, we all felt that um, some additional professional development offerings, whether they were uh, required to take part in the district offering um, that, that day or something specifically customized to the food service workers, but we felt we could um, offer them opportunities to come in um, and pre receive some professional development. So the, the contract added some language to that, um, requiring them to come for at least four meetings, um, professional development days um, on those early release days. The, another uh, highlight was the establishment of a joint compensation subcommittee. So we, we started this process a little bit later, um, just given the, the schedules, and when we finally got going, it was, it was already in April. Um, but there was a lot of conversations around how we could maybe look at other ways to compensate employees, either to both to maybe make their pay a little bit more consistent, a little bit more regular, um, that they could uh, certainly expect and not have sort of breaks in and pays given their, their schedule around um, school vacation weeks and so forth, and also ways that we can maybe make our process of just tracking, tracking days and our old payroll process easier. So we had some good conversation about it, but we felt like it needed more. Um, so we, we felt the establishment of a joint subcommittee uh, that would uh, re revisit the conversation back in the fall, um, you know, through the winter months next year. Uh, would be worthwhile. Uh, another highlight was the establishment of a floater stipend, um, and this would be something where two, up to two designated employees that would work at the middle school and the high school um, would have an opportunity to receive a small stipend, um, and they would be the designated food service workers that would travel to the elementary schools should, if and when we need a coverage situation and when unable to get a qualified substitute to do so. So hopefully that's minimal. We always try to, to minimize that situation, but it does occur. And we felt it was, it was um, appropriate to provide some level of, of compensation and then um, recognize folks that want to go about and learn the other schools and, and, and don't mind doing some traveling um, to move to the other elementary schools when the district is in need to, to do that. Um, and then we sort of got into the really the, the, the financials and the cost of living adjustments. Um, and the, over the three years, um, the, the proposal includes a, a two and a half percent in, in the first year, a three percent cost of living adjustment in year two, and a two and a half percent cost of living adjustment in year three. Um, it did include some changes to the function hourly rate, uh, which is currently about 1848 and the proposal was to increase that next year to $20 and then have it move with the subsequent cost of living adjustments in years two and years three. Um, so there was a lot of market analysis uh, that did go into um, the proposal of the cost of living adjustments that were proposed and agreed upon. Um, and you know, we did look at neighboring surrounding communities and, and what the market uh, you know, standards have been in terms of hourly rates and so forth. So we did feel like this was a fair proposal that would certainly keep um, our hourly rates competitive uh, within our peer districts um, over the next three years. Um, and I just really appreciate the, the folks that, that worked on it. I, I, um, you know, in, in the, in the, with the food service workers, I think it was a really good, good conversation. Uh, they did meet um, already, and they did they did ratify the, uh, the agreement um, uh, based on these terms. So, um, you know, if the agreement is approved tonight, you know, we would have we would have an agreement to move forward with. It's not in the report, but you do need a vote tonight. We do need a vote tonight. <clears throat> so, right. the, the, I would just like to add a couple of quick things. I mean, first and foremost, thank you, Michael, for all the work and 
you say, we, we did a market analysis, Michael did a market analysis, <laughs> and he says, we worked on this. 99% of this was Michael's work. Um, I wish that I had Michael for every contract that I ever negotiate because he comes in fully prepared with all I the do. information. <laughs> <laughs> with all the information, just puts it there. Um, and, and to the food service workers as well, um, they were great from the very beginning. They wanted to know where what we were what we were looking for, what you know, where our priorities were. One of our priorities was making sure that you know we can increase you know offerings after school on the weekends, and you know we found a way to you know entice people to do that because many many of the people that work in food service honestly have other jobs, and so we need to be competitive with the with the market to get their time outside of the school day, and so I thought they were great with that, um, and you know, and, and I think they also they have done a lot in the past for us and. The reality is we used to subsidize this program, you know, quite a bit. And, you know, it's it, it's not just Chartwells. Chartwells re receives a lot of the accolades for balancing the food service budget. But the reality is the the people that work in in the in the schools mm -hmm. are a big part as well. I mean, my kids love it. They like the people there and, you know, they do they do a wonderful job. And so I think yep, they absolutely. you know they deserve a fair contract. And I just think overall, I think it's important for the school committee that I think we've put an emphasis on continuing to meet our partners, meet the people that we work with, and find a contract. And again, sometimes it's harder than than other years, but I think it is. I think it's very important that we, as a board, continue to try to find you know, you know, a middle ground with with the people that we have contracts with. And so I appreciate them working with us. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, so I guess we. Uh, I need a vote to accept the. I have, I have one qu question. Yes, that is just from my own, my own of information. Uh, if more, more people than two apply for a, a stipend like the Florida stipend, how do they? How is that decision made? So uh, the posting and the language that we did talk about it was if all else is being equal, it was really it would be based on seniority, yeah. um, sense, you know, yeah. qualifications, and so experience being equal, <coughs> seniority would be the determining factor. Yeah, and I thought I thought with the stipend, I thought that was a really mm -hmm. great thing from Michael to bring up because the reality is, on our last contract, we had the ability to force people to do it anyways, yeah. and they weren't complaining about it. But I think it's great that, again, I mean, we're working together. This is just for coverage if we need to at the elementary, and you know, this hopefully gives something back to the people that are volunteering for that. And I, I think it's a great way. I mean, I think we that that's. That goes a long goes way. A, a long small stipend goes a long way to people. Yeah. They feel like they're being respected and not, you know, well, we have the ability to do this, so we're going to just be able to force you to do that. And fairly yeah. compensate them for a little inconvenience. Yep. So, okay, we have a motion to accept the Food Service Workers Collective Bargaining Agreement. I move that we accept the Food Service Workers Collective Bargaining Agreement. Second. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. There you go. Okay. Well done, gentlemen. Now on to the minutes. So we have two minutes. We have the open session slash school committee workshop from May 13th. I don't think I saw anything on this one. We have a motion to accept the... I'll entertain the... Oh, I, I will make the motion <laughs> not entertain anymore. <laughs> um, to accept the open session workshop of May 13th. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. And how about the regular meeting? I make a motion to accept the open session of May 13. Second. Any discussion? Did I really get assigned to all those subcommittees? <laughs> <laughs> you did. I used that actually on the MASC when they were like, well, what does different people have? I was happy to be going through this. I was like, oh, there we go. That's what we have. Um, OK, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Finance and operations, Mr. Yes, Connolly. Thank you. Um, so, actually, under the sort of the food service operation realm, um, this evening there's a couple of things in the financial and operations update related to the food service program. Uh, the first of which was there was a memorandum included in your packet with a recommended motion um, that impacts the school lunch prices for the 2019-20 school year. Um, so. There's some recent legislature that was passed um, really over the last uh, you know six seven years or so that does somewhat regulate the 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 paid lunch prices that each school district is uh, is required to to charge and um, 
you know, I think where they're going here is that they want to ensure that the amount of, of revenue that's generated through through paid lunch sales um, is enough to support the the cost of those of, of selling paid lunches, and that when you do when a district does participate in the USDA school lunch program and does receive a level of federal reimbursement for the sale of both um, you know, free and reduced lunch mails, that that's not subsidizing um, your cost of, of, of the paid, paid lunch program. Mm -hmm. uh, so there actually is a formula that districts are required to complete and submit um, on an annual basis um, based on the amount of lunches sold and what your prices are that kind of um, com com comes to a Compute sort of a weighted average in the 2000, really 18, 19 weighted average was was two dollars and ninety two cents, and we actually as a district fell slightly below that average um, for the first time this school year. So in a sense, we were somewhat out of compliance in the existing school year. Uh, we did apply for in a waiver of that based on um, the fact that we did operate a profitable program last year, and if you're doing that and you can show evidence of that sometimes they do approve a waiver we, we did subsequently receive that waiver was approved for this year um, and we did undergo a review um, this school year as well so I, I tried to I took an excerpt of that review and the, the review was comments and inserted it into the memorandum um, but as you can see they are citing the fact that we are sort of below um, the threshold, the 292 threshold, and they are re recommending or requiring that we we have a plan to raise lunch prices to kind of bring us back into compliance. Um, you can see our kind of our district response um, that was dated back in March, where we said you know we we had planned to to bring this to the committee in, you know later in the spring for a recommended increase. Um, so it's actually been about, I believe it's actually been about five years since the last increase we had. We increased prices just before the official opening of this building, the high school building. So this building's been in operation for five years mm -hmm. now. Um, so we don't really take lunch price increases uh, lightly. You know, we want to make sure that we're, we're doing it with some thought and, and we, when we um, have kind of look, looked into it. So the idea when we increased the prices five years ago was, again, we were in at that point in time, I remember back um, doing the, the calculation, we were very close to running below that minimum uh, weighted average threshold. And if we had not increased five years ago, we would have fallen out of compliance in that subsequent year. So we increased it to a point where we felt we weren't gonna be, it was gonna be good for about four or five years, and that was the case. Uh, we didn't wanna get into a situation where we're coming back every year and adjusting you know, lunch prices. Um, so we so we felt um, the increase we had would sustain ourselves for four or five years. Um, we also did a market analysis at the time, which we did again, and we looked at some of the area pricing um, for this past school year, the 2018-19 school year, from some of the surrounding communities, and that pricing was also included in, in your packet this evening. So I think it's fair to say uh, the, our, the administration's recommendation of, of an increase would be to go increase um, 25 cents at each level, which was similar to the increase that we did a five years ago. Um, and we felt, you know, mainly what that would do is it would allow us not to have to do an increase, we think, for the next four or five years. Um, we think that would put us at about 312 or 310 of that weighted average threshold. Right now in the 18-19 school year, it was 292. Although I, I'm expecting that to go to 297 next year, um, they go up every two or three every other year, and they have not gone up in a couple of years. And they have, they don't release that until actually late June, early July. But I've gotten indications that 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 weighted average amount would, would be about 297 next year. So this would put us at about 310, the recommended increase of 25 cents um, at each level, bringing the elementary level to three dollars um, for a paid lunch type A lunch in the middle school, high school from $3 to $3.25. Um, so we feel like that would sustain ourselves over the next four or five years and we would continue to, to look at this and we would be in compliance. Um, and then looking at the market analysis, we also feel like that is not sort of put us out of whack with what areas communities are doing. I actually think many of these communities are in a similar boat that we're in and I, I just looking at 
the listserv that I'm on with um, surrounding communities that are many are listed here, they're talking about lunch prices and they've been some through some reviews and I think some of these folks that are listed here are going to be needing to increase, if not next year, um, in the very near future as well. So um, out of these about 15 or 20 or so communities that I pulled, most of them Cape Ann League or, or surrounding area, um, the elementary school lunch price is about 290 and then you know, the middle school, high school, you're looking at about 315. So for the time being, I think it would put us slightly above that, that average or the, the, the median that was included in this area, but although I do think that's gonna go up to the level that we're recommending, um, if not next year, in the very near future. So, um, you know, we, we definitely played with a few different scenarios. You know, I think if we, quite honestly, if we went up only 10 cents per level, we would meet the 297. I just, you know, plugged it in my, uh, my template here. We would be at the 297. Um, but then I think we're just, we're coming right back here in, in a year's time and, and having to kind of wrestle with this, which we'd rather not do every year. We'd rather have parents kind of get comfortable with something, know that that's going to stay the same for three, four, even up to five years, um, especially something like the, the lunch price. Uh, we'd rather stay a level of consistency uh, for a period of time. So, you know, I think that's all we, we play with a few scenarios. Um, I think this is where the, the administration kind of landed on, on our recommendation this evening. I have talked to Chartwell's um, representatives and so forth. They are in support of our recommendation this evening as well. Um, so that being said, I'll just open it up to any, any comments uh, or questions. I, I don't think anybody wants to increase lunch prices, of course, but when you hear right. out of compliance and submitting waivers, you know you have to do something, unfortunately. Um, the only thing I would say is for the recommended motion, it would be middle school and high school, correct? Correct, okay. yeah. Oh yeah, I should say high school too. <clears throat> Other comments, Please. questions? Uh, I have a question for you, Mike. Um, so just on my, my math, it's about uh, going up a quarter a meal if someone's buying lunch every day, it's like an extra 45 bucks over the course of the year, give or take. Do we have any way of knowing if or how many members of the community that would make a real effect on or are on the uh, level? It's, so I looked at the, just the, the pure amount of, of paid, you know, paid meals that we were selling at roughly sure. at each level, um, and then did some computation, some calculations on what that would yield. Um, you know, most of our population is, is paid, is, is paid. Mm -hmm. We have about 10% that qualify for free or reduced. Um, and we have about 40% of our participation that actually you're purchasing a, a, a you know a, a lunch a type mm. a lunch even some of that's a meal equivalent that they're purchasing a la carte that computes to a, a meal um, so I would say it's it's fair that's going to impact about 25% of our student population you know in that yeah. range okay um, yeah so it's but not this would not an insignificant but, amount but this would not impact you're not going to see an increase in whether they qualify for free or reduced meals is separate from the price. Correct. It's right. About that's their own, correct. right? Yeah. Right. That's, yeah, that's their. That is correct. Yeah. Oh. Um, I had one other yep, quick, quick one. Um, I guess I guess I kind of agree. As a parent, I would have agreed one raise every four or five years is fine. Does anybody feel like your parents would rather have it? No, I agree with you. Time. Better than a nickel a year. Yeah, just for well, consistency's I, sake. I, I, I don't know. I, I kind of agree. The other, I, I, I sort of see the other side of it too, though. I mean, and, and so I know with, yeah. of course. I mean, I'm, I'm a lawyer. I take the other side. Oh. Um, the, well, number one, like I remember a couple of years ago when fees had to be increased, and the the fee increase was very high because we hadn't done a fee increase for yeah. a number of years, and so like again, this is a quarter per meal. It's forty five dollars for the year, so it's not that much. But my other concern in this one, and again, I mean, I will go along with it if that's what's recommended, to be honest, but my, just kind of for the record, my concern is I also don't like the idea that we're making money off of the regular lunches that are being proposed. And so it, it looks like we'll make $14,000 extra. We have a balanced food service contract now. Obviously, we have to make an increase of some sort. We have to be in compliance. But I don't know that I love the idea of we're, we're making money on the food on on the regular meals that are being sold to kids to then use for something else um I, I see how it makes it easier year over year just doing it one time every four years but a part of me also and, and and again i don't think many people are not going to buy because of this but the reality is we have seen 
an increase of people using it over time. And I don't know, that, that's, that's just my concern is that if we are, you know, charging more, we're making a profit on the meals that are being sold to use that in another area. It almost looks like we're, it's a fee, it's a, it's a well, surcharge, it, it's being used for, to support something yeah, else. There's a lot and of it should needs. line up lot, more. The yeah. program has a lot of needs. And even though yeah. oftentimes chart rolls re, would report a, a net profit, um, the district responsible for capital repairs, right. improvements, things that are outside yeah. of the chart rolls P&L. And are very expensive. And are very expensive. So we're, at, we're quite, quite honestly, we're actually still operating at a loss. Okay. Um, that's and that's just, a good point. Good point. So it's yeah. not quite, we're not, even though we report on chart rolls P&L oftentimes throughout that they've, yeah. the stuff that we're responsible for, yeah. which is yeah. the, the equipment that we own from the district, the repairs, the upkeep, Preventative maintenance, which we're trying to take out to the next level. We've actually contracted with some preventative maintenance service um, companies next year to keep um, our <coughs> equipment kind of up to date. So that has a cost to it as well. Right. I mean, as, as a rule, I try not to disagree with the administration too many times in one night. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So could we have a motion to accept? Actually, but, but Diana, since you made the correction, do you want to make the motion? I sure can. <laughs> um, I moved to increase type A lunch prices by 25 cents at the elementary and middle school and high school levels for the 2019-2020 school year. That increase will make the elementary lunch price $3 and the middle school high school lunch price $3.25. All second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Bernard, staffing? I think Michael has one other thing. Oh, under his, oh yeah, his so um, just, uh, just another point of information. Yeah. I, I thought this was interesting. I get this re kind of report cards from, or scorecards from My School Blocks, which is the online mail payment summary that we utilize through for school lunch uh, payments, online payments. Um, <clears throat> I just thought it was an interesting piece of, of information um, that we've continue um, to, to increase our online lunch sales and the online volume has been going up um, some each, each year. Um, it, it went up in the 17-18 school year and it continued to go up again in this 18-19 school year, um, which I think is, yeah, is always helpful. Um, you know, information helps to increase the, 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 the sale at the point of sale, increase the, lun the lunch line and I just, I thought it was interesting so I, I just shared that with you. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, I think it's great that we, you, people see in the news some of the complaints and concerns about how the school lunches and who's getting them at other places. I think we've, you know, we've done a very good job under your leadership on, on this. So appreciate Thank that. You. So. Thank you. Okay. Now, Mr. Bernard, staff. Yes, just, just one. Okay. Um, I'm pleased to announce that we have hired a new nurse at the Hood School by the name of Jessica Blanchett. She is our only new hire since um, since your last meeting, but I expect July I will have a lot more to report on. So I'll keep a running list for you. Thank you. So welcome to Jessica. And no bids and donation at this time. I will just say, if I may, Mr. Chairman, that of course. although I'm disappointed that I don't have any uh, <laughs> bids and donations to read, we had a great year for bids and donations, and since this is yeah. a, sort of officially the last meeting of the school year, uh, thank once again the town uh, yeah. for its generosity as yep. it, as they come through every year. We did. We had a lot of come in just this these past few days that didn't quite we, we, make the pack. We'll, yeah. But, um, and we'll be one, sure to one very sizable too. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. just great. today, right? We got right. that one yeah. today. So we just didn't want to rush it. Through nope. Tonight. Look forward right. to acknowledging them. It's gonna, in July. Yeah. It's thank you for sharing yeah. that because it really yeah we marvel at the right. generosity. I think you know pretty regularly throughout the year. Right. But you know, what what continues. I plan to do just so everyone saw the July 29th meeting. I'll there will be. The final, the, the final quarter, like the April, May, June in-kind donations by the parents and support groups right. yep. would be tallied and calculated and presented. Um, any final donations that came in in June, so the final fiscal year. Yep. Um, and then I'll also provide the, the final tally, that spreadsheet, That's which great. I've done in the past. Yep. So you can see how we've done and, and where all the gifts and in-kind donations and that happened throughout the year, I'll, I'll, I'll include that in the packet as well. Excellent. Okay. So the Fine Arts Subcommittee, which a quick note after the Little, the little Mermaid Junior, I was talking to some parents and pointed out that we have the Fine Arts Subcommittee and people 
were amazed that we did that, like that we were supporting them, and they thought that was very cool too. So I'm I'm very happy that we can do that, and I think the community appreciated that as well. So Fine Arts Subcommittee, the first meeting, correct? Or we did? Yeah, our first yeah. meeting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Chime in. Uh, yeah, we uh, we sat with. Uh, Carla and Ali, and uh, got the perspective of what's going to be coming up in the coming year. Got their feedback about um, about how the fee structure is working, and um, it really was it was positive. There there weren't a lot of things to fix; just uh, a few ideas were lobbied around for uh, for improvements to make for the future. I'm not sure how detailed were were we. I want details. Come on, to get good comments. Oh, yeah, what did what, what was the uh, one so we were, they were talking about? Um, this is a conversation about. Um, about um, finding a way to formalize uh, pay for um, for students and graduates who help right. in uh, managing sound during uh, during major events, yeah. and uh, finding the right path to do that. Yeah, there's a couple of different yeah. money type yeah. things. Uh, uh, you know, just to uh, I think uh, add some clarity or some uh, make some more efficiencies in terms of making sure they have people where they need them. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Are they are they eligible for volunteer hours or not for doing those? That's a great question. I I don't know if it ever comes up in those terms. Because um, yeah, there's like a requirement. Mean, mean community for, service type. Yeah, of community hours. service. Yeah, there there's know, there's a requirement, the, correct? Student student community it's, service hours. Yes, if students volunteer their time to run you know the lights for the little school, for example, do they are they eligible for community service hours for that? I wouldn't say they're not eligible, but they yeah. they need to be trained. They would need to be right. Trained. There's a certain amount of proficiency, yeah. and it's and it's also no. But I'm saying um, people that do it instead of in that they were talking yeah. about possibly paying some of those people. But what if could they get? Yeah, I don't know that they are okay. now. Okay, it, so that's what I'm not sure. It's also such a it, it, it requires enough training that really it, uh, it 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 warrants a fair bit of pay for doing it. Yeah. So I think yeah. that on the one hand, opening it up and making it um, making it available as I would feel weird about uh, the idea of crediting somebody for public service if they're getting paid, and I'll feel right, equally weird about not paying them for uh, yeah. for doing it. But it's well, I'm, I'm thinking more of an either or. So yeah. yeah. Huh. Um, but I think everyone's excited about it, um, uh, and I hope the community. I'm glad that, that if, 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 anecdotally that, that people are, are happy we're doing it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It was a good meeting. Okay. It was a good meeting. Yeah. And and I'm the music man is uh, yeah. the, the big production, which is. Uh, uh, another great uh, uh, sh uh, choice because you can get so many people involved. You can just make the town as big as you want. There you go. <laughs> and also the uh, wait, uh, except put it in my calendar. The uh, <coughs> yes, uh, October nineteenth. There's going to be the Hunter Playground, which as a new dad that that struck me that uh, that the schools uh, the helped out with Martin's Masker's, pond area. Masker's yeah, gonna, Masker's is going to put put on a haunted playground apparently. <laughs> yeah, right. they're, they're working it out, but. We determined at that meeting. I met with them on Friday, and yeah, we're we're going we're moving ahead. That's uh, that's yeah. so thrilling. Yeah, good. So the uh, the dream team over there want to continue on policy. Uh, so we 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 fixed all the policy problems. Oh, wonderful. It's right. all set. It's wonderful. perfect now. Um, we, we picked up in section G and got a small way part of the way through it. Yeah, the section G is definitely one of the more yeah, one of the big densest big. ones. Yeah. Um, I don't think we came up with anything that we'll be bringing for the committee or did was I got a little bit of homework to check some legal references right we, we and went, we went through a fairly good number yeah and we made a couple of non material uh, tweets yeah. but um, okay good excellent so subcommittee schedule coming up contract review has been changed to July 2nd at 830 again yes yeah Diana sure okay Substance Abuse Coalition, June 25th at the police station, 10 a.m. NORCAM Board of Directors, June 27th, 7 p.m. at NORCAM office. Finance Planning Team, July 18th, 8, 8, 15 a.m. at the Superintendent's Conference Room. Policy Subcommittee, July 29th at 3 p.m. at the Superintendent's Conference Room. Athletic Subcommittee, September 18th at 12.30 p.m. in the Superintendent's Conference Room. Fine Arts Subcommittee. September 25th at 2.30 p.m. in Superintendent's Conference Room, followed shortly thereafter by the Policy Subcommittee, September 25th at 3.30 p.m. Superintendent's Conference Room. Administrative materials, Mr. Bernard. I just want to ask Mr. Pepe Vasilio, is that the, the 29th going to work for you? Uh, it, 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 it certainly does. I was going to ask if you wanted to push it to 3.30 and have it seamlessly link into the uh, school committee meeting. But. I don't know I if was, that's... I was thinking during that time of year, I could probably do more than an hour. So if we... Yeah, oh, okay. Well try to get, then then to I get, think that makes sense. I'm going to try to get more done. I, I would appreciate okay. that. Yeah, right, so that's we'll a great idea. Down and 
Yeah. Right at three. I think because I think our goal is to try to get through by the end of the year by your. That by your, that is that is my goal. Yeah. So that uh, we're sure. starting with a clean slate. To drag you two to the finish yeah. line. We'll me. get there and get FMLA is coming up. So that's by hook be. or crook. Yeah. I, don't I think we can do it. <laughs> uh, I think we can do it. Okay. Uh, the only thing I had was uh, I, I just I felt like I should give you a little report tonight, but I, the, 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 it's been said already. But um, little the Little Mermaid really was very cute. It was very well done this weekend um, with the Little Schools Drama Program. So I just I wanted to give them a little shout out. As, as some of you know, we had a transition in the uh, leadership of that program. We hired two young ladies to come in uh, from out of the district and did. I think they did an outstanding job. They really Great. did. And, and I know talking to Mrs. Molly. Again today, um, she was very pleased. So there was some, there was some good size shoes there to be filled. But uh, I, I think it really went off without a hitch. And I think it was. Well, I didn't see Friday night, but Saturday was a pretty, pretty, pretty packed <coughs> performing arts center. So it's a nice, again, another nice thing for our community. I just want to give them some public acknowledgement. Yeah, I mean, I think I think Friday night was actually probably more packed. And what I th actually thought was very nice was there was a large contingent of teachers from the little school that went of all different grades to support the students there as well, which I always think is nice. I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the kids, a lot of the fellow students were there. They were all very excited to interact yeah, with their teachers great. outside of it. And Mrs. Molly looked like she was ready to have a heart attack, but she got through it. So. <laughs> okay, so correspondence, no correspondence? No Mr. correspondence Brown? tonight, sir. Okay, future business. We have the school committee goals workshop on July 29th. We're not gonna be together for a while, guys. 4.30 p.m., superintendent's conference room. And the regular school committee meeting after that. And then if we need another goals workshop before the August 26th meeting. Have we ever needed the second one, John? Absolutely. We have needed it, but we, not always. We, we have had Mel Webster on the committee in the past, so. I have a feeling we'll need it this year. <laughs> I think we will, too. Okay, well. Or maybe we'll be all in agreement. It's hard to know. Any, uh, can we can have a motion to adjourn? adjourn. So moved. Second? Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you, everyone.